One of the highlights of my life was to wear one of the most beloved masks Stan Lee created. And it's even more of an honor to present the Comic Con Icon Award to my friend and the ultimate comic book icon, Stan Lee. This man. This man. Sam Raimi and this guy, they made Spider-Man. It couldn't have been what it was without this guy. He is the greatest. Thank you, Sam. And I'm a jealous guy. I wanted to be Peter Parker. So if I say how good he is, you can believe me. Hey, thanks so much, really. Thank you. I hope Sam was listening. Sam's here. Is he here? Sam, now come on, you promised. Give me two lines next time, wherever you are. walked into the room and I saw just there was goodness in his face. There was something in there that said, I trust this guy. And he had this kind of connection or relationship to the character and it was something that he had loved all his life. So I think that's what got him the job, to tell you the truth. He's very inspiring to work for. He really loves Spider-Man with such a passion and and he just, his eyes twinkle when he speaks about Spider-Man like a little boy. Oh yeah, I was terrified going into making Spider-Man. I never thought that I would get hired for the job. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. It's your pal Noms here. I'm so sorry this video took so long to make, and I'm very sorry for its ridiculous runtime, but it's finally here, and that's what's important. If somebody told you this was going to be a happy little review full of admiration and praise, well, somebody told the truth. But that being said, this video is all about a movie. That movie. Spider-Man 1. The comic book movie that we've all loved since before it was even cool to like comic book movies. I wish I could tell you that's the director. Hell, I'd even take him. Actually, wait, you know what? No, I wouldn't, because this movie was directed by Sam Raimi, and it's fucking amazing. This movie came out in 2002, which is incredible, all things considered. And even more so when you consider this year is the 20th anniversary of this film. But actually, that's the very reason why I decided to make this video, to celebrate this magnificent movie's 20th year of release. Though, looking back, it's not hard to see that this was certainly an early 2000s movie. From the prevalence of analog technology, and the practically non-existent elements of today's digital era, which to be fair carried on for the rest of the Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, as well as the campy wackiness that was a staple in comic book movies up to that point. You get the ice, I'll get the ice, man. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up here. <laughs> Do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. I missed. I never miss. Are you in or are you out? It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. Wrong answer! To the use of slow-mo in a fight scene whenever something dramatic happens. Now don't get me wrong. The late 90s, early 2000s are my jam. It's the era I grew up with, and damn do I miss the style. Light-hearted, comic book camp mixed in with everyone being a supposed kung fu master, which eventually led to every action scene in the early noughts taking <coughs> inspiration from The Matrix, all the while having some mainstream hard rock or metal track blasting in the background to give you that big fight feel. Point I'm getting at is Spider-Man 1 has all these elements from the late 90s, early 2000s era, 
but at the same time, Sam Raimi and his artistic vision was still able to put a fresh spin on it and usher in something new. Coming right off the heels of Blade, another film I look forward to talking about eventually, and of course, X-Men 2000. Spider-Man didn't just wow us with its awesome fight scenes, jaw-dropping, web-slinger action, and special effects, but it also proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that comic book origin stories can be adapted faithfully and beautifully, and it further proved that superhero dramas could be taken seriously and enthrall you despite the campy nature of what comic book stories tend to be. Blade and X-Men were great, but neither was an origin story per se. And you can make an argument for Tim Burton's Batman, I suppose, but undeniably Spider-Man 1 was the next step. It was a leap of faith on behalf of Sony, Sam Raimi, and the late great Stan Lee, and wow did it ever soar. So let's talk about what makes this movie one of the best of its kind. We're going to run through the entire movie and then I'm going to do something of an epilogue of sorts to pay homage and praise the film's production and creative team. Also, before we get started, I just wanted to give a shout out and thanks to Coolman229 and A British Potato for helping me put this video together and for giving me a ton of great feedback while doing it. Wouldn't have been able to get this done in as timely a manner as I did without the two of you. I've linked both their channels in the description, so go check them out. They make great content. Right, now with all that said and done, finally, let's get started. The story begins with an introduction to Danny Elfman's iconic Spider-Man soundtrack. I'm no music specialist, but if I had to describe Spider-Man in two words, it would be mysterious and amazing. You're so mysterious all the time. You are amazing. I don't know what exactly Raimi told Elfman to do, but his soundtrack absolutely fucking nailed it. And it captured those two elements of Spider-Man perfectly. And not only that, but his score just gives the entire story and the trilogy itself this feeling of epic scope. It's so unique, wondrous, and it lets you know you're about to witness something special. After the opening credits, we're greeted by Tobey Maguire giving us a monologue introducing us to the life of Peter Parker. He's got a secret to share with us. Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. If somebody said it was a happy little tale, if somebody told you I was just your average ordinary guy not a care in the world, somebody lied. And this opening sets up the journey he is about to be set on that he will come full circle by the end of the movie. But for now, all we need to know about Peter is this. <laughs> Man, you are one pathetic loser. <laughs> Nobody outside of his immediate family and his best friend, which we'll get to, wants a bar of him. And through his eyes, we see he believes himself to be so pathetic, he makes other losers look good by comparison. I'd like to tell you that's me next to her. The heck, I'd even take him. Hey! Stop the bus! <laughs> that's me. Hey, tell him to stop, please! I like the fact that Raimi cast this nerdy librarian chick and this fat slob who are stereotypically seen as outcasts, and both of them wave Peter off, not allowing him to sit next to them. Now, I've heard people criticize this opening for the bus driver buying into the classroom bullying culture directed at Peter by deliberately ignoring him and refusing to stop the bus for him, as well as laughing along with them at Peter's misfortunes. Look, maybe it's a bit much, but I'm fine with the movie exaggerating tropes for the sake of entertainment or to establish characters. And speaking of which, who here is the voice of reason? Why, none other than Mary Jane Watson, who's been given the trope of the popular chicken class, largely due to how good looking she is. Now you might say, well that's a bit presumptuous, Noms, to assume she's popular for her looks alone, but I say that with absolution because it's the truth, and the movie points this out numerous times by both showing and telling. Arachnids from all three groups possess varying strengths which help them in... Well, maybe he'll be impressed no matter what. You think I'm pretty. I think you're beautiful. But Peter's monologue details how he's been in love with Mary Jane Watson for a long time. For as long as he's known her, in fact. The girl next door. Mary Jane Watson. The woman I've loved since before I even liked girls. And though they aren't particularly close, despite Peter longing for her, Mary Jane does notice him. Though she tries not to let on about it, presumably because of their history as neighbours in addition to being classmates, as well as the fact that Peter is seen as an outcast by all the popular kids and obviously she has a boyfriend. But one of the reasons why I say MJ notices Peter, and I'll come back to this in a second, the way her face lights up when Peter strikes up a conversation with her and 
offers to take her picture for the school paper. Hey, uh, can I take your picture? I, I need one with a student in it. Sure, yeah. Great. Where do you want me? What I'm trying to get at is this scene establishes Mary Jane as the popular chick at school, but it also establishes that Mary Jane isn't your typical high school diva. Oh my god! I love your skirt. Where did you get it? Uh, it was my mom's in the 80s. <gasps> Vintage! So adorable. <laughs> That is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen. She appears to be a little misunderstood, and ultimately she just wants to be noticed for who she truly is. There's only one man who makes me feel like I'm more than I ever thought I could be. That I'm just... me. Skipping ahead, we arrive at the University Science Lab, but before the film takes us inside, we get our introduction to the Osborne family. Harry, Peter's best friend, and his father Norman Osborne, renowned scientist, billionaire, and CEO of Oscorp Industries. And it's clear right from the get-go, the two don't have the best relationship. What, you want me to trade in my car because you flunked out of every private school I ever sent you to? It wasn't for me. Of course it was. Don't ever be ashamed of who you are. I'm not ashamed of who I am. Just... Just what I am. Forget it. Harry's had trouble at school, so much in fact that Norman's had no choice but to enroll him in a public school like a regular kid, despite his wealthy background. But it's clear that Harry, to an extent, resents his wealth for a myriad of different reasons, perhaps due to him going through a rebellious phase against his dad, likely his acting out at school was a cry for attention from his busy father. I guess he's sort of a nerd, odd duck, the classic son trying to win the affection of the father and maybe at times just rebelling to get attention. We later see that being part of the upper class puts a target on Harry's back as well, especially at a public school. What's daddy gonna do? Sue me? <laughs> but most of all, because his wealth is directly linked to what strained his relationship with his father, which is his work, Norman's a nice guy, a, a brilliant man, but his line of work hasn't allowed him to connect with his own son the same way he can connect with someone like Peter on an intellectual level. Throughout the film, it's revealed that Harry is disinterested in science, and it's likely possible he resented it because of how it affected his relationship with his father. Wow, that's amazing. This is the most advanced electron microscope on the eastern seaboard. Oh. Norman, however, immediately takes a shine to Peter when Peter shows him glimpses of his genius. It's just a shame Norman has been unable to connect with Harry in the same way, but we'll explore this more later on. We also get another taste of Peter's genius inside the spider labs when he gives Harry a bunch of creepy fun facts about spiders. Some spiders change colors to blend into their environment. It's a defense mechanism. Peter, what makes you think I would want to know that? Who wouldn't? And while this is going on, Peter and Harry get harassed by Flash and his goons. We see Harry looks out for Peter like a big brother type figure, which gives the audience some insight as to the extent of their friendship. But Harry, on the other hand, is also shown to be kind of a backstabber and not entirely trustworthy. He's Peter's best friend, but he's got a crush on the same girl as him and he hasn't told him yet. And he even steals Peter's line, the line he said he had no interest in knowing. You know, spiders can change their color to blend into their environment. Really? Yeah, it's a defense mechanism. Do you know that this is the largest electron microscope on the eastern seaboard? And this isn't the only time Harry undermines Peter for MJ. Later at the graduation ceremony, when MJ and Flash break up, Harry immediately slides into her DMs, so to speak, and the two start seeing each other. And Harry doesn't even tell Peter until months later, after Peter finds out on his own. Maybe it's a coincidence, but I'm willing to believe it's not that Harry does this twice, and both times it's after having to watch Peter and Norman bonding in the way he's always wanted to with his own father. It's no question that Harry harbors some resentment for Peter as the film goes on, despite the fact they're best buds. But as time goes on, this resentment gets worse and worse, and actually kind of culminates in Spider-Man 2. Don't act like you're my friend. You stole MJ from me. You stole my father's love. And you let him die, because you didn't turn in the freak. Isn't that right? <laughs> but we're jumping too far ahead. The point is, we get to see that Harry and Peter are very good friends, but based on what the film has and will show us, Harry isn't exactly the most trustworthy person, and does backstab Peter, whether it's due to resentment or not. 
All the while this is happening while the scientist tour guide is outlining all of the spider species and abilities that have been integrated into the very spider that will give Peter his powers. MJ makes the observation that one of the spiders is missing, but the tour guide insists that the lab technicians are just currently working on it, when in actuality, and unbeknownst to them, the spider is loose and free, and is a danger to everyone in the lab. Harry's moment with MJ is cut short when the hilarious whispering teacher interrupts their conversation and escorts Harry away for, I'm sure, all kinds of crazy and elaborate torture. What's daddy gonna do? Sue me? <laughs> what is going on? The next person who talks will fail this course. I kid you not. This grass spider. Let's go. You were talking throughout that woman's entire presentation. <laughs> Let's go talk about how we listen. But this has left the door open for Peter, as Mary Jane is now alone, without her popular friends or Flash and his thugs to get in the way. This is a chance where he can talk to her without the embarrassment or threats from other students. So Peter strikes up a conversation, and you can tell immediately without the pressure of others around her, Mary Jane's face kind of lights up when Peter makes a move, offering to take her photo for the school paper. It's a really sweet and wholesome moment between the two, and like I said, Mary Jane has noticed him a little bit. Sure, she's also completely ignored him, or at least that's the way it appears to Peter, but in actuality, Peter's just kind of been in the back of her mind, as Kirsten Dunst puts it. She has a bad childhood, bad past, and abusive parents, and in the beginning of the film, she always tries to date the football player, or be popular, or just cover up her home life and, and try to be somebody who she's not. She catches little glimpses of Peter Parker's love for her, but it doesn't really register in the beginning. It's kind of just lingering, I think, in the back of her mind. And he's always endearing to her and always makes her smile and makes her feel good about herself. So when he finally gets around to talking to her, it's no wonder she's very happy to talk to him when... Peter finally gathers up the courage to do so. She knows he's a nice guy and that he's sweet. And I'd imagine, given the company she keeps, it's a nice refreshing change of pace. And as Peter conducts his little photo shoot, all the while that rogue genetically enhanced super spider has been slowly making its way down and lands on Peter's hand. And Sam Raimi zooms the camera in nice and close just enough to give the youngest of us attending the premiere arachna fucking phobia and many sleepless nights i should know because i was one of them thank you sam you bastard My eyes! but anyway peter is bitten by the genetically modified super spider and immediately looks freaked out and i'll admit it's quite odd he remains quiet about this you'd figured he'd be in panic mode since these are not your everyday spiders and who knows what the fuck that bite will do to him especially since the final shot of the scene lingers with that spider's image on one of the monitors and it's listed as a completely new species. Oh well, maybe Peter inquired about it off screen I guess. We don't really know because the scene ends here, but hey what's the worst that can happen right? But anyway look, aside from that, the reason why this film's opening sequence is so brilliant is because Sam Raimi and his script writing team packed the first 10 minutes of this movie with so much exposition about the character's backstory and relationships to one another, and the very sci-fi comic book elements this movie is based on, but it's so well integrated you'd hardly even know it was there, it's just seamless. And on the viewing experience, it's so densely packed with setup for what's going to come later on, there are certain details you can miss unless you watch it multiple times. One such example is after Peter is bitten by the genetic super spider, Sam Raimi decided to simplify things with a simple, discreet visual cue outlining every single one of Spider-Man's powers. That's a fuck ton of exposition in one shot. Well done. It's easy to miss, but it's there. And that's my point. All the details here work to set up, establish, and familiarize the audience with the characters, the comic book world, and premise and its story. Bravo. Next we cut to Oscorp, and before I continue, can I just say how much I love the way Oscorp looks? It's industrial, realistic, but it bears some resemblance to what a comic book factory might look like. I didn't feel it was proper to have a super stylized world like the comic book world like you see in a lot of comic book films. I felt that the most important thing to do was to create a real world. There are parts of New York that are magical. So what we decided to do was just to create a whole city of those realistic, magical parts of New York. Again, Sam Raimi wanted to make this setting as realistic as possible, whilst still being comic faithful, or as faithful as fans could expect with some exceptions. 
We're introduced to Dr. Strom, presumably Norman Osborn's second in charge and closest collaborator, especially since he'll be the only other person Norma later selects to be part of his secret and incredibly risky experiment. Dr. Strom is showing off Oscorp's crown jewel of military technology, the hover glider and flight suit, which will ultimately become the tools of destruction for Spider-Man's villain in this story later on. This goes back to paralleling Norman Osborn's journey towards villainy, with Peter Parker's journey towards heroism. Similarly to the previous sequence with Peter Parker and seeing all of the superhero characteristics he will eventually acquire, we get to see the superhero, or in this case supervillain characteristics Norman Osborn will acquire as well. Although I'd argue Peter's is far more nuanced because we don't get to see the Goblin's arsenal as of yet, but I'm fine with his weaponry being something akin to a bag of tricks that he'll spring on Spider-Man when the time comes. Because from what I've gathered, that's the kind of villain the Green Goblin is from the source material, and the animated series for that matter. A mischievous, maniacal bad guy who loves to cause anarchy with his bag of tricks. Although there is one or maybe two instances where I'd say this has taken a tad too far, but let's not get too pedantic about it. I'll point those out briefly as we run through the movie. After the brief demonstration, Norman Osborn enters the lab, and it's made pretty clear that Strom isn't doing this to impress their visitors as much as the board is essentially yanking Oscorp's leash at the behest of General Slocum, who just from the tone of his voice, from his very opening scene, lets us know that he is not there to play games or waste time. And it's outright implied that he is not a fan of Oscorp, and he has no qualms about letting anyone and everyone, even Osborne himself, know about his disdain. I've already seen the glider. That's not what I'm here for. General Slocum, good to see you again. I want to see the progress report on human performance enhancers. Slocum skips the small talk and inquires about Oscorp's progress on human performance enhancers. Dr. Strom makes the professional but perhaps ill-advised move to be blunt with the general, stating that they'd conducted many tests on rodents who showed promising results except for one very curious case that alarmed them. Norman Osborn, on the other hand, being a businessman as well as a scientist, opts to smooth things out by placing emphasis on the success they've had instead of that one case which Norman insists was an anomaly. They showed an 800% increase in strength. Any side effects? In one trial, yes. It was an aberration. All the tests since then have been successful. What were the side effects? Violence, aggression, and insanity. And what do you recommend? That was only one test. With the exception of Dr. Strom, our entire staff certifies the product ready for human testing. But General Slocum refuses to let Norman shun Dr. Strom and instead asks the good doctor what his professional opinion would be on how to proceed and thus an iconic line was born. Also a good bit of foreshadowing for what's to come. Dr. Strom? We need to take the whole line back to formula. Back to, back to formula. formula. <laughs> Nonetheless, General Slocum, as I said, has no qualms with keeping his distaste for Norman Osborn out of his mouth. Even later on, being completely transparent with Quest Aerospace, Oscorp's rival company, about how much he wants to see Oscorp go under. Now, what about your commitment to Oscorp? Nothing would please me more than to put Norman Osborn out of business. That being said, we never really get much of an insight into why that is. There was a line of dialogue cut from this exchange that details how the military was fed up on waiting for Oscorp to produce results regarding the human performance enhancers. I think after five and a half years of R&D, the United States government has a right to expect field uh, But I think the reason is a tad more personal than that. Because what we do get is the general wanting results, but also wanting the experiment to be safe and ethical. I've seen a number of comments saying that this is a tad unrealistic because the armed forces would still jump at the opportunity to use the performance enhancers and condone human testing without a second thought, and certainly to continue bankrolling the project based on the success they've had with the rodent tests. But that's precisely my point because General Slocan says this. Dr. Osborne. I'm going to be frank with you. I never supported your program. We have my predecessor to thank for that. The armed forces did support the program avidly, but the general was against it on principle and therefore was against Oscorp on principle. And especially Norman, who likely pitched the project in the first place. Now we don't need a full-blown segment to explain this because that would be veering off course, but what we know is enough to infer that the general hates Norman because he was against the program Though given the amount of R&D they've put into the project by this point, 
the investment still needs to pay off. If I had to change something small here, I would have personally left that line in about the R&D and the finished cut, just to make things a tad more clear. But hey, there's a reason why this movie has the best pacing in the entire Raimi trilogy, and arguably better than any other comic book movie to date. But even though the investment still needs to pay off, the General isn't particularly happy about it, which is why he only gives Norman Osborn two weeks to do so. And he even pours more salt on the wound by telling Osborn if results aren't produced within the time frame before Quest Aerospace tests their latest military project, they will get all of Oscorp's funding, which based on Norman's reaction, will leave them firmly up shit creek. They test in two weeks. And if your so-called performance enhancers have not had a successful human trial by that date, I'm going to pull your funding. I'm going to give it to them. The closing shot tells us just how concerned Norman is for losing his company, and his expression lets us know that he's considering doing something very drastic. I'll get a little more into what Norman's driving force is for going down his self-destructive path, but that's somewhat later into the video. For now, we cut to the Parker residence and get introduced to Uncle Ben and Aunt May. Sam Raimi couldn't have cast a more perfect Uncle Ben and Aunt May than Cliff Robertson and Rosemary Harris. Rosemary Harris in particular, who's had 50 plus years in the film industry by the time Spider-Man was even released in 2002. Peter arrives home from school and heads straight upstairs to his room where he collapses and begins to shiver like he's violently ill. Now this is exactly how one would react in this situation if their entire molecular structure was beginning to change. It's a very small sequence, but it lends so much to the believability of someone acquiring superpowers. And it's something that still 20 years later I have not seen replicated to equal or greater effect. The Amazing Spider-Man is probably the closest example, but even still in that movie, Peter gets his powers almost instantaneously after taking a nap on the subway. And that's it. The only side effect we see is that he has a big appetite when he gets back home. As for Spider-Man Homecoming and Civil War, we don't even get to see Peter's origin story, though it's understandable why they wouldn't want to rehash the same story for a third time. So fair enough. But on the other hand, Into the Spider-Verse didn't even attempt to show Miles struggling with his transformation. Just that he had a sort of restless sleep. But then again, the whole idea of Miles finding a radioactive spider randomly in the sewers near a company that for no conceivable reason would be working on genetically augmented spiders in the first place was also contrived as balls. At least Sam Raimi's Peter Parker got bit randomly inside an actual cross-species genetic spider lab, and at least Sam Raimi understood that the transformation should be visually depicted and not forgotten about or treated like a joke. Then we cut back to Oscorp where Norman Osborn is about to do the unthinkable, what any mad scientist would do when they have no test subjects and no choice and that is disregard protocol and test his unfinished, unperfected performance enhancer on himself. Now unlike Spider-Man 2's demonstration of Doc Ock's fusion reactor, this is not for spectators or the scientific community or publicity or the press. This is 100% breaking scientific ethics and most definitely breaking the law. The lights are off, the cameras are off, and the lab has been deserted. The only two people that are in on this is Norman Osborn and once again his second in charge and biggest skeptic I might add, Dr. Strom. As the conversation progresses, Strom predictably raises concerns with Norman who ignores his reasoning because he makes it clear Oscorp's back is against the wall and he will not give up Oscorp no matter what. To Norman's credit, he's taking the responsibility upon himself to save his company and his employees. So what the character is doing here is actually what can be considered as quite brave and commendable, if certainly dangerous, very dangerous. And once again, I also got to commend Sam Raimi for injecting a lot of realism into his science fiction dialogue. Get me the promochloroparazine. For what? It begins catalyzation when the vapor hits the bloodstream. What Norman is basically saying, though most of you likely already know this, is the liquid he just drank is going to act as something of a catalyst for the reaction when he breathes in the vapor from the performance enhancer, as the molecules enter his blood through the capillaries. This type of realism injected into science fiction dialogue was also utilized quite well in the demonstration scene of Spider-Man 2, 
Nanowires feed directly into my cerebellum, allowing me to control fusion reaction in an environment no human hand could enter. If the artificial intelligence in the arms is as advanced as you suggest, couldn't that make you vulnerable to them? How right you are. Which is why I developed this inhibitor chip to protect my higher brain function. It means I maintain control of these arms, instead of them controlling me. But that's for another time. Back on point, we see Norman's being brave and reckless, but that's not all. Another line suggests he's also doing this purely for his own selfish ambition. 40,000 years of evolution and we barely even tapped the vastness of human potential. Whoa. What a line, by the way. That is some deep shit. But this tough-driven exterior that Norman is putting on is somewhat fractured when Dr. Strom locks him into the experiment. And you can see the terror in Norman's face when his character starts shivering. <laughs> As many of you no doubt already know, Willem Dafoe's line here was entirely improvised. But Sam Raimi decided to use this take because the reaction was authentic and absolutely lent to the scene. So predictably, the experiment goes horribly wrong, Norman flatlines, and Dr. Strom ends the experiment prematurely and goes to try and revive him. And to Dafoe's credit, when Norman wakes up, his expression alone makes him look like a completely different person. In an incredible display of his newfound strength, with one hand, he throws Dr. Strom through the safety glass and is ultimately killed via electrocution. Norman, now transformed, both physically and mentally, exits the chamber and it cuts back to Peter. Peter wakes up to find that his physique has completely transformed. His vision has been corrected to the point he no longer needs his glasses. He's so energetic, in fact, he scares his aunt and uncle on his way out of the house, only to catch MJ in crisis almost racing out of her own house with tears in her eyes after dealing with her father. Peter catches up to her and is preparing to make a move, trying to think of what he could say to strike up a conversation. This allows the audience to get a deeper understanding of how Peter feels towards her. I don't know if you realize this, but we've, uh... We've been neighbors since I was six, and I was wondering if maybe together sometime, maybe do something. Or, I don't know, or not it be time to get to know each other. Or not. But the moment is cut short as MJ is whisked away by her friends, and Peter once again dashes to catch the bus. Only this time, he actually tears off the bus's banner. And you can see for the first time, since gaining his newfound strength, Peter is a little freaked out about what's going on, and what he just did. Not realizing what exactly just happened or why, just that whatever it was is very strange indeed. Norman Osborn, on the other hand, wakes up in his penthouse, dazed and confused. Harry finds his father having just spent the night on the floor, much to both of their surprise. Though something that's kept very much ambiguous, at least for this portion of the film, is Norman's recollection of his alter ego. Did Norman remember the whole night, or did he just only have bits and pieces? Because it sounds like he was about to tell Harry where he was... But then he did remember what happened and chose not to. Last night I was... What? I don't remember. Mr. Osborne? After which his assistants barge in, telling him that Dr. Strom has been murdered and the Oscorp glider and flight suit, their prized military asset, has been stolen. Like I said, at the moment, there's enough for the audience to infer that Norman isn't entirely aware of what's happening though later revelations will change this. We then cut to Peter's high school and we see our dorky outcast having lunch alone in the middle of the cafeteria, invisible as always. But who should pass him by but Mary Jane? And it looks like it might be yet another time where she once again, unintentionally, passes him without acknowledgement. Except, nope. Peter instead has his first trigger of spidey sense and catches Mary Jane from slipping on some spilled juice and what I imagine would have taken many, many, many takes. Kudos for Toby and Kirsten for sticking it out. Mary Jane thanks Peter, even complimenting his newly acquired reflexes, and then she says something rather peculiar. Hey, you have blue eyes. I, I didn't notice without your glasses. Did you just get contacts? <laughs> Mary Jane, as I previously mentioned, knows who Peter is, at least at face value, but in terms of her world and how she perceives it, he is just the nice dorky kid with glasses who's kind of floundering in the background, but this is the first time she notices a detail about him. As previously mentioned, Mary Jane is a very misunderstood person, and what she longs for the most is for someone to notice her beyond just the superficial, which has a kind of sad irony to it because that's all Peter has ever wanted from MJ. And as the movie progresses, the more Peter embraces his gifts, 
the more confidence he gains and the more MJ starts to pay more attention to the details about him. I'm not talking about details regarding Peter's superhero persona. That's saved for the end of the movie, when she starts to catch on. Though I will need to address something relating to that in just a second, but I'm talking about the small things. Nice, tiny little details people tend to notice about the one they hold affection for. And like I said, Peter has just taken his first step towards that newfound confidence with her. And you can tell by the way he's so assertive when he catches her. Care to tango? Yes, I would. It's just a damn shame he froze. Though this is obviously since he's still at the start of his journey and is still quite timid around MJ. It's a real pity all that rehearsal from before didn't pay off. Well, see ya. Ouch. Anyway, aside from that, the whole purpose for the cafeteria sequence is to give us a showcase of Peter's newfound abilities, setting everything up for the rest of the movie. Anyway, sitting back down to try and finish the rest of his lunch, Peter accidentally shoots a web out of his wrist, much to his own shock, and after taking a moment to absorb the lunacy of what just happened, he realizes that, thankfully, no one saw him do this. Hey, for once it paid off for Peter to be a pathetic loser who no one pays attention to for a change. Peter doesn't really know what to do, but before he draws attention to himself, he tries to retract the web, but accidentally drags a fully loaded lunch tray with him. His quick reflexes allow him to dodge it, but who would that crash into why none other than Peter's schoolyard bully, the alpha jock straight out of Greece himself, Flash fucking Thompson, and he is pissed. Peter hightails it out of there and drags the lunch tray along with him, which causes his schoolmates a lot of confusion, but they also have a big laugh when it gets stuck in the door. Ha <laughs> typical Peter, what a loser they all thought. Anyway, Peter rushes to his locker, pursued by Flash, and we get yet another, this time more nuanced look at Peter's spider sense. And this allows us to see that Peter can tell just about everything that's happening around him, although he can't see it. This next dose of spider sense is what saves him from getting blindsided by Flash, and so we are treated to yet another classic schoolyard bully fight scene where we get to see Peter's abilities on full display in a combat scenario. Reflexes, speed, athleticism, and strength. We also get to see Flash's ungodly ability at spouting off retorts. I don't want to fight you, Flash. I wouldn't want to fight me neither. Peter wins the fight easily with a single punch to the shock of everyone at his school, or at least the ones who saw it, including MJ and Harry, but a few special cases out there, and I mean really special cases out there, seem to think this should have immediately outed Peter as Spider-Man later on in the movie. Okay, so I'm going to have to go into some depth here explaining why some people who say this should have outed Peter as Spider-Man immediately don't know what the fuck they're talking about. But then again, that's nothing new for the internet. Okay, so firstly, Spider-Man doesn't exist yet, and he won't exist for several months, and it'll be even longer before people get a good look at him through Peter's photographs. What do we have to talk about? Why now? Because we haven't talked at all for so long, your Aunt May and I don't even know who you are anymore. You... The Amazing Spider-Man! My name's the Human Spider. They test in two weeks. I know this has been a difficult time for you, but I want you to try to enjoy this day. Good news. My father got the place in New York, so we're all set this fall. Yeah. Oh, that's great. He's a criminal, that's who he is. A vigilante. A public menace. The problem is we don't have a decent picture. Eddie's been on it for weeks. We barely get a glimpse of him. Oh. What other skills do you have, Parker? I was thinking of something in photography. They're crap. 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 Mega crap. And again, that's just it. People outside of well-placed eyewitnesses only get a good look at what Spider-Man looks like and what he can do through photographs. Regardless of super strength or whatever, the only eyewitness that could even remotely make the connection is Harry, but only in Spider-Man 2. Harry <laughs> This doesn't change anything. And of course, MJ, who in this film, for the most part, is just happy to have not fallen to her death 
or in what's probably the most edgy scene you'll ever see in any Spider-Man movie, Mary Jane isn't so much obsessed with who Spider-Man is as she's just relieved to have not been sexually assaulted by those muggers. When I was up there, and I thought I was gonna die, I kept thinking, I hope I make it through this so I could see Peter Parker's face one more time. But there's an important detail a lot of people miss. See, after MJ is saved from the street thugs, Spider-Man puts himself in a very vulnerable position for her and she still chooses not to unmask him because she realizes that Spider-Man needs to keep his secret identity. He is out there for a reason. She believes in what he's doing. She respects that and to keep it sacred. I'll come back to the kiss in the rain later on. Also, just for argument's sake, let's just play out the scenario of MJ putting Peter on the spot and asking him if he's Spider-Man. Peter, are you Spider-Man? I'm not. Yeah, so for anyone saying this, you're kind of forgetting the fact that Peter has a gigantic fuck-ton of plausible deniability. But for now, the case that Peter should have been outed by the events at the high school is, well, there is no case. Too bad this little thing called context exists. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, no one actually saw him shoot the web. And people wouldn't have assumed that it was Spider's web at first glance anyway. Especially without Spider-Man being a thing yet. When this happens in Spider-Man 2 and the woman recognizes the substance as a spider's web, Spider-Man has been active for two years by this point. It's a web. Go Spidey, go! For the students or staff for that matter at Peter's high school, to put the pieces together and know who's behind the mask is quite frankly absurd. A friend of mine put it really nicely actually. If people at the high school saw the nerdy kid in class running out of the lunchroom after having some white string attached to his wrist and the lunch tray, they would have just likely thought that the kid had been pranked. <laughs> but for the students to put the pieces together on their own, there is simply way too many factors that play into it. The students would also have to have essentially no life and comb over every nook and fucking cranny based on a vague memory from a random day at high school and then they'd have to form a fucking mystery ink and go to extreme lengths to find out the truth. Let's just say for argument's sake they go to the cops. Uh, excuse me, police officer man? We know who Spider-Man is. Cool, who is it? Uh, it's Peter Parker. How do you know? Uh, he punched a guy really hard and did a double backflip. Okay... Oh, but, but he also has some white stuff hanging off his arm. Was it a web? Uh, we think so. Are you sure it wasn't glue? Uh, well, you see, it was a while ago. We didn't get the best look at it. So you're telling me this is all from memory? Uh, that's right. You want me to convict a young man for being Spider-Man based off a of memory? Uh, that's right. Do you have any tangible proof or evidence? A video, perhaps? Uh, no, sir. Smartphones aren't exactly a thing yet. <laughs> But again, that's indulging the sheer insanity that this might actually happen. Here's what an actual cop's reaction would be. Who are you? What are you? Who moved the rock? Like I said, these kids would have to be off the bloody spectrum, as well as having absolutely no life in order for this to happen. Which doesn't surprise me, considering where I've heard this and similar criticisms come from. The fact of the matter is, these kids have their own lives and problems. Hell, they're teenagers. They probably have drama on the daily. Case in point would be Harry's difficult relationship with Norman, Flash and MJ having a ton of relationship troubles, MJ constantly dealing with her parents, giving her crap all the time. You really think these teenagers give half a fuck about a random day at a high school months ago when they're dealing with bills to pay, new jobs, being neck deep in college? Yeah, I didn't think so. Sorry for the tangent, but that stupid argument needed to be squashed hard. I've also seen people criticize this scene because Peter is treated like the wrongdoer in this instance, but actually that's just Flash's posse that actually have a problem with what he's done, with the exception of MJ who's just kind of freaked out, but obviously knows Peter was in the right to defend himself. Everyone else on the other hand was in utter amazement and even cheered when Flash got his comeuppance. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, the only people who made Peter out to be the bad guy were the bullies who didn't like getting a taste of their own medicine. Jesus, Parker, you are a freak. Stings, doesn't it? But yeah, most of the teenagers in Peter's school are actually happy to see Flash get his comeuppance. Harry most of all, but the thrill quickly wears off for Peter when he realizes how terrified Mary Jane was of him in that moment. 
So he makes the wise decision to flee the high school quickly before everyone starts asking questions. After all, not even he realizes just what exactly is going on. Sure, it felt good to knock the shit out of Flash, but you can tell Peter is startled by his own strength, as anyone would be freaked out, I suppose. But I gotta say, I've always loved this shot of Peter looking up at the spider in the alleyway, and suddenly realizing why his hand stuck like glue to the bus banner earlier that day. So Peter asks himself, what more can he do? As if following the spider's lead, Peter begins to climb the walls, and like a wave washing over rock, his fear recedes, and you see his face light up with excitement as Peter decides to embrace these newfound gifts. Then we have an uplifting, if somewhat dated, jumping sequence. Peter has grown faster, more agile, and his legs are strong enough to leap ridiculous distances from building to building. When he finally comes to a distance that he can't make by jumping, he remembers the webbing he shot from his wrist back at school. And we get some of the most hilarious improv from Tobey Maguire as Peter cycles through all kinds of incantations and hand movements trying to figure out how he shot the web in the first place. Go web! Fly! Up, up and away web! Shazam! This brings me to a couple of side points here. Firstly, the directing approach Sam Raimi took towards this project. Yes, he is the director, and yes, he oversees everything and ultimately has the final say on all creative decisions unless it's Doctor Strange 2, The Multiverse of Madness, and with the exception of studio interference by Sony executives. But in addition to that, he's also an excellent collaborator, and he allowed the actors to give tremendous amount of input and contributions of their own in order to bring both the characters and the world to life. And this extended past simple improvisation. For example, it was Tobey Maguire, in fact, who was the one that described the kind of apartment complex Peter and Harry would share together, Kirsten Dunst was the one who insisted Mary Jane wouldn't solely be a damsel in distress, which is why she puts up a fight during the mugging scene we're going to talk about later. I definitely didn't want her to be just a damsel in distress, you know, it's definitely Spider-Man needs to save her a bunch, but, you know, I talked to Sam and I was like, you know, she needs to kick a little butt and defend herself. And like I said before, Sam Raimi was happy to keep that specific take from Defoe back in the laboratory experiment scene. But honestly, with Willem Dafoe, it's difficult to recognize where the improv stops. Skipping ahead for a second to Norman's introduction to Mary Jane, there's this awkward silence where they think Peter might be upstairs in the apartment. And Mary Jane is a little timid of Harry's father and she can't maintain eye contact with him because he's giving her one of the creepiest, most perverted stares ever. Now this is the point in the movie where Norman is deep into his madness and both his personalities are at the point of constantly overlapping with each other. So this may have very well been a part of the script, but my point is due to Sam Raimi's willingness to let the actors take the reins at times, and not to mention just how natural and organically this creepy demeanor is portrayed by Willem Dafoe. This and many other moments as well could easily be mistaken as improvisation. Sam Raimi, the director, runs a pretty fun set and really encourages the actors to personalize stuff and bring stuff to the role and invent stuff. So people are always inventing things and surprising you. Good. Okay, that's clean. Okay. He's a great collaborator. He really just in general made me feel like a part of the team, like I was really contributing a lot to to the film. I love working with him because he's just a great example for me of a man who takes his work seriously. And Raimi's collaborative approach to directing this film definitely worked to its benefit. But back to Peter and the spider webbing, let's quickly and diligently address the elephant in the room. Organic web shooters. There's certainly a very loud minority of fans who dislike this creative decision, because it's not strictly speaking faithful to the comics, or for that matter the animated series. When that spider bit you, did it give you power to make webs too? No, I did that myself. I make web fluid and store it in small pressurized containers that load into these web shooters I built. Wow! You must be super smart to think this stuff up. Now there's certainly a case to be made regarding whether or not Sam Raimi was justified in making this decision. Though, I think it's safe to say the majority of Spider-Man fans love, tolerate, or are simply indifferent about this decision. I, for one, fall into this category simply due to A, it doesn't impact or betray the foundations of Peter's character, and B, it has virtually no bearing on the story 
whatsoever. If this creative decision was relevant to these two aspects of the movie, I'm sure many more people would take an issue with it. But for those who do, there's a solid case to be made, with arguments that don't support Sam Raimi's choice in this instance. The first being the removal of the mechanical web shooters takes away from Peter's genius. The fact that he built his own web shooters as this poor, nerdy kid from Queens. Something that was meant to add significantly to the genius aspect of his character. And that is true. But the counter-argument here is that Sam Raimi in both this movie and its sequels goes out of the way to show many instances of Peter being exceptionally smart. Like the conversation earlier that we briefly touched on, where Peter meets Norman and tells him that he read, understood, and wrote a fully-fledged scientific paper about Norman's research on nanotechnology. I read all your research on nanotechnology. And you understood it? Yes, I, I wrote a paper on it. Impressive. Your parents must be very proud. Now, anyone who's ever had to read a scientific journal and write essays or reports for university knows just how hard that is to fucking do. Trust me, if you're an early university student reading PhD scientific papers, it's like reading an alien language. Having to know what all the terminologies mean and deciphering it to the point where you understand the ins and outs of the study is very, very hard. So Peter being able to do this with Norman Osborne's research in the 12th or possibly even the 11th grade since he's speaking in the past tense, now that is nothing short of exceptional. And like I said, this isn't the last example of Peter's genius, not by a long shot. Some spiders change colors to blend into their environment. It's a defense mechanism. Harmonic reinforcement? Go on. An exponential increase in energy output. And not to mention, just for reference sake, I happened to come across this interview where Tobey Maguire himself responds to this criticism and he brings up an interesting point. Because fans are somewhat obsessive and, and protective of the characters they love. Well, the, I think the most controversial one that I can remember was the web shooters prior to the first movie. And would they be uh, organic or would Peter make them? Because in the comic books, he makes them, doesn't he? He makes them, that's and right. And I know Sam thought, how's that going to happen? How's a kid going to, and he was essentially a young teen or a very young man, yeah. make something which, you know, big companies couldn't make enough to make. So they had that's it come right. out of you organically. That's right. Yeah, it didn't seem plausible. And also my, my argument for that was, if he could do that, if he was that intelligent, scientifically minded, couldn't he be wealthy from that and not taking photos yes, for... Yes, he would need to do it. Yeah. Now, the second argument for why the mechanical web shooters should have been included, and I believe this to be the more practical argument, is that the organic web shooters give Spider-Man an unlimited supply of webbing, whereas the mechanical web shooters had a limited supply that Spider-Man can use before having to switch cartridges, and this added to Spider-Man being a more grounded superhero. This would often lead to him being backed into a corner and severely hindered during fights with his villains in both the comics and the animated series, and oftentimes would actually force Spider-Man to have to retreat when this happened. Whereas with the organic web shooters, this is never really a problem, the exception, of course, being Spider-Man 2, but that was more of an issue of Peter losing his powers rather than actual webbing issues. But the point, I think, still stands strong, especially when you take into account that these mechanical web devices can actually be destroyed. But that being said, some people seem to cling to this like it's some sort of Achilles heel for the movie and why other adaptations of Spider-Man are more faithful and accurate to the character. And I suppose they'd have to be, since that's pretty much the only characteristic those other Spider-Man adaptations have that is more faithful than this version of Peter Parker and Spider-Man. There's also one other commonly thrown around criticism that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man isn't humorous enough and that he doesn't make enough jokes or quippy remarks, but I'll come back to that one. It's you who's out, Gabby. Out of your mind. However, while some blame Raimi for this slight alteration from the source material, it's actually a little more complicated than that. See, for the longest time, Spider-Man was stuck in development hell, and of all people... It was James Cameron who was originally planning to make the movie, but for whatever reason, it just never happened. Now, I love James Cameron. Let me make that crystal clear. And if it meant getting a James Cameron-directed Halo movie... I would crawl on my belly through hot coals and broken glass! That being said, it was a blessing in disguise that it never materialized since we ended up getting this movie instead. But according to Spider-Man's screenplay writer, David Cope, Co-op consulted Cameron's original story treatment, which he found quite compelling, as well as the idea of having organic web shooters as opposed to mechanically based ones. He became so enticed by this particular part of Cameron's story treatment that he decided to run with it for this movie as well. 
and Raimi agreed. So regardless of your position on the matter, well, there you go. Lastly, Sam Raimi has gone on to say that there was no real malice behind the choice to make the web shooters organic, and that he's a huge fan of the Spider-Man comic books. But in addition to feeling that the artificial web shooters weren't realistically plausible, he also thought that Peter having the innate ability to shoot webbing would also make his character feel more sympathetic and relatable to the audience, due to Peter feeling like he's even more of an outcast because of these abilities that he now possesses. Now, in the comic book, which I'm a giant fan of, he is a genius, and we're going to keep that. He's a very smart kid. Uh, but when he can develop a material that even 3M Corporation can't seem to develop, it starts to distance him from a real human being. It distances him from the average kid in high school. So we felt that the best thing to do was, since he's bitten by this spider and takes on the powers of the spider, crawling the walls, the ability to leap like some leaping spiders have, um, the great proportionate strength of a spider relative to his size, we felt it was a logical progression to let him also spin his own webs. And in that way, keep him a complete human being that we could identify with and being consistent with, well, once he's bitten by the spider and takes on all of the powers, why not, why just take on four of the five? Why not just take on all five? That it's a great choice, and it was inspired by James Cameron's treatment. I think it's a great choice to help alienate him, to make him feel cut off, and to, to really embrace the spirit of who Spider-Man is, this misunderstood hero who's an outcast, who's cursed with these powers. For now, let me just wrap things up on the web shooters by saying there's arguments for and there's arguments against both versions. Yes, the mechanical versions are more faithful to the character and the source material. But organic or mechanical, both web shooters both work for Spider-Man. And personally, when I was a kid, I found it incredibly strange when I found out Spider-Man in the comics couldn't shoot his own webbings. It just seemed to me to make a shit ton of logical sense to make that an innate ability of the character in the first place. And that's a stance I've now kept for 20 years going on, but that's just me. Anyway, Peter finally gets the web to work after several attempts, and scared out of his mind attempts his first ever web swing, and after all, what could go wrong, right? This is going to be a shame. <laughs> Hello. After Crash landing and presumably being knocked out and unconscious for a while, Peter rushes home and we already get the early signs that these powers could be messing with his head. He's already starting to neglect his responsibilities, not keeping the promise he made to his 68-year-old uncle to help him paint the kitchen. May, I'm 68 years old and besides, I have a family to provide for. I love you. You're the most responsible man I've ever known. I do like, however, the little nickname Michelangelo that Uncle Ben has for him. Kind of adds to his charm and speaks wonders about the relationship he has with Peter. Hey, Michelangelo, don't forget we're painting the kitchen right after school. Don't start without me. And don't start up with me. But while Peter takes out the garbage, he has another encounter with MJ, who once again is leaving her house to get away from her verbally abusive parents. At first, she's a little hostile with Peter, thinking he might have been eavesdropping, but she simmers down and starts conversing normally with him, remembering that they are neighbours after all, so he's as used to her parents yelling as she is. I do attribute this and the fact that Peter doesn't judge or make a big deal out of a situation is one of the big reasons why Mary Jane feels like she can be herself with him in this instance, because this is the first time the characters have a heart-to-heart -heart with one another, and this is the first time we see MJ open up to anyone, and it's the Peter of all people. And it just so happens to be about her hopes and dreams. Mary Jane kind of goes on this journey by herself because she comes from a very hard home life and she kind of covers it all up. And Peter's really the only man that she's shown a vulnerable side to and it's been out and he's accepted her for what she is. In the comics, as far as I know, Mary Jane is actually meant to be a supermodel. And at first glance at her character, you'd probably assume that's the direction her character would likely be heading in. A theater student at ESU, Mary Jane looks stunning in this fur leopard skin print. Wow, that outfit brings out the animal in me. But like I said, under the surface, there's much more to her than that. It turns out that she has an appreciation for the arts, and she longs to be a stage actress of all things. And this leads to one of the most adorable exchanges where we get a window into just how much history these characters have with each other. Despite not being all that close with one another, we see just how attentive Peter is as he recounts Mary Jane playing Cinderella while they were in early elementary school. I want to act on stage. 
Really? Well, that's perfect. You're awesome in all the school plays. Really? I cried like a baby when you played Cinderella. Peter, that was first grade. Well, even so. You can also tell Peter's powers have started to give him some newfound confidence by his body language, his eyes, and the way he speaks to Mary Jane. And this does end up resonating with her quite a bit. Much like Peter notices and remembers little details about Mary Jane, she starts to be attentive to details about him. Hey, you have blue eyes. I, I didn't notice without your glasses. You just get contacts? You know, you're taller than you look. I hunch. Don't. Help me! I'm feeling! I'd imagine knocking the shit out of her boyfriend had something to do with his little confidence boost. And speaking of which, who else but Flash would show up just to ruin the moment at the worst possible time? Whisking Mary Jane away in his new convertible. She has a bad childhood, bad past, and abusive parents, and... In the beginning of the film, she always tries to date the football player, or be popular, or just cover up her home life and, and try to be somebody who she's not. She has a weakness for pretty boys with fast cars. She's only human after all. But this gives Peter an idea. If beating them doesn't work, join him. To bag himself the redhead, he's first got to bag himself a fast car. So Peter looks for affordable automobiles and comes across an ad to pro-wrestle a dangerous competitor for three minutes in order to score $3,000. And then, in what I'd be willing to bet was some kind of wet dream for Mr. Sam Raimi, we get this awesome montage of Peter drawing designs for his dream costume that would ultimately become his symbol for heroism and fighting crime. Fun fact, the sequences where it's zoomed in on the hand drawing the image is actually a fully trained Marvel Comics artist, which... In retrospect, it makes a lot of sense, because I always thought Toby was just an absurdly good illustrator. But anyway, Peter finally settles on a costume design, but I'm guessing this scene was filmed early on in production, because there's a change that was made somewhat after this that I'm about to get to. Moments later, there's a pretty funny scene where Peter is training his web skills in his room, like it's mainly been inserted just for a little bit of comic relief, and to show Peter experimenting with his powers, but it's an amusing little scene nonetheless, and it does serve to contribute to his aunt and uncle worrying about his well-being. Uncle Ben in the very next scene, in fact, expresses these concerns to Aunt May. Maybe he's too embarrassed to tell me what it is. Maybe I'm too embarrassed to, to ask him, you think? I don't know. I just don't know anymore. And thus, when Peter lies and says he's going to the library when he's really going to compete in a pro wrestling competition, Uncle Ben opts to drive him personally. And just a small point I wanted to make here is that this wasn't random just for the sake of the plot. Peter had been worrying his aunt and uncle for quite some time now. Did, did you get some pictures, Peter? I got a crash. Everything's fine. What's that all about? And Uncle Ben wants to have a heart-to-heart -heart with him, even nearly forcing Peter to stay in the car with him so that he could open up. And unbeknownst to Peter, what should be a very simple conversation with his uncle, just like any other, would ultimately be one of the defining moments in his life. His uncle tells him the ability to beat someone up doesn't give him the right to. He's getting older and needs to be more careful with what kind of man he's going to become. And life isn't like a schoolyard brawl where the worst you'll get is a detention. This guy, Flash Thompson, he probably deserved what happened. But just because you can beat him up doesn't give you the right to. The world is unforgiving. There's choices and there's consequences for these choices. And then Uncle Ben utters... What was, and arguably is one of the most iconic lines in comic book history and in fiction itself. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Obviously, Uncle Ben is just referring to the power and responsibility that comes with adulthood, but he's unaware of just how literal that can be applied to Peter's situation. Hence, one of the reasons why this one simple but powerful line resonates so strongly with him, and essentially becomes Peter's code to live by for his whole life. The other reason is because this is the last conversation he will ever have with his uncle. In the moment, however, Peter doesn't want to heed his uncle's words, and like a typical rebellious teenager gets extremely defensive and gives his uncle attitude instead of understanding. And I know I'm not your father. Then stop pretending to be. Needless to say, they don't exactly leave things on the best of terms, something that Peter would later come to deeply regret. And I love the way the shot lingers on Uncle Ben's car as it rounds the corner. It's very subtly foreshadowing that this is going to be the last time we as the audience are going to see Uncle Ben alive and well. 
And it's also ironic that this shot is coming from Peter's point of view. And he's actually eagerly waiting for his uncle to disappear around the corner and out of sight so he doesn't have to walk into the library. This, folks, is a textbook example of why you should never leave things on bad terms with friends and family. Sorry to preach, but that's something this movie and this scene taught me that to this day I have not forgotten. So now we cut to the pro wrestling event and it is absolutely brutal. <laughs> but here's where we encounter a bit of an issue. See, pro wrestling in the real world is fake. Or at least, they are essentially scripted fights orchestrated by professionals. It's still hard hitting and risky, but with industry insider tricks under the surface to protect the athletes from sustaining any real injury. Matter of fact, when a pro wrestler gets injured, that's pro wrestling gone wrong, essentially. Oh my god! No! 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 Now that being said, pro wrestling in this movie is actually real. <laughs> Meaning they're actually trying to kill each other with chairs and golf clubs. That's something, that line came, came from <laughs> a real story. Rob Tappert once was driving uh, in Detroit and he had just, my, old, my partner, a good friend, and he was going past an automobile accident. They were pulling some guy out of the car and that's what he was screaming. Oh, really? <laughs> my legs, oh God, I can't feel my legs. As horrible as it was. I'll twist it. That's, that's why it's in the picture. This is a pretty big stretch in logic and Sam Raimi even said he wanted this movie to be as realistic as possible while still being comic book faithful. But I can understand why he made this exception, because after all, this is a comic book New York with mad scientists and science fiction villains. But this is also meant to be Spider-Man's origin story. And this is actually how it happens, more or less, in the comics. And on top of that, the whole point of this pro wrestling gig is that Spider-Man's powers are meant to give him an unfair advantage that allows him to win and make some money. But that really wouldn't make much sense if this was regular old scripted pro wrestling from the real world. So with all that being said, I think it was a perfectly fine choice, and it does certainly help to serve the story being told, despite it being a stretch of logic from our own reality. Now we come to some of the most awesome cameos you will ever see, that being the textbook inclusion of Bruce Campbell, the lead star in Sam Raimi's flagship series Evil Dead. Fun facts, the car that Uncle Ben was driving actually is the same make and model as the car used in the Evil Dead series. And Sam Raimi makes a point to have it included in every single one of his movies that he'd had up to the point of making Spider-Man in 2002. With the exception of a western movie he did called The Quick and the Dead because cars didn't exist in the wild wild west. In addition to that we get the legendary macho man Randy Savage as Bonesaw McGraw. Bonesaw is Randy! Oh yeah! Anyway, Peter checks into the event most likely under an alias since he obviously doesn't want his aunt and uncle finding out about this. And without going on another tangent, I always get a chuckle from the check-in lady who looks at Peter like he's about to die before <laughs> before checking him in. Yes. Down the hall to the ramp. May God be with you. And so later on, Bruce Campbell, the legend, gives Peter his introduction and what a reference to the comics. I mean, somebody had to say it. The Amazing Spider-Man! I also think it's adorable that Peter, being such an out-of-touch nerd, thinks the human spider sounds edgy. My name's the human spider. I don't, no, he got my name wrong. Get you out tell there, me. you moron. It's completely in character, and it works to show that Peter, while changing into this superhuman with powers, can't escape his nerdy nature. He's still the same dork on the inside. And here's what I was getting at. See, as I previously mentioned, Spider-Man using his powers to make easy money from pro wrestling is indeed from the comics, but in the animated series he's using his fully completed Spider-Man suit. Which is why I think this change in the movie was made after the drawing montage that we just witnessed, because in the upcoming chase scene, early animations clearly show Peter wearing the fully completed Spidey suit. I have a funny story about this. We did a test, the CG, which was a very early iteration of this scene right here. 
I took the test. I called Amy Pascal and John Kelly, and I said, we put Toby in the suit. We tested him climbing up a wall. You know, we put a wall on its side, and I want to show it to you. We were in pre-production. And I called them into the screening room, and they came down, and um, they watched it. It was CG. I said it was Toby in the suit. They oh, went nuts. Really? They said, oh, my God, it's amazing. He looks so... so this must have been changed later on. And I think it was a good decision to change it because Pete is a poor kid from Queens and this is still early on in his superhero development, shall we call it. So I can understand and would even expect that he would have some kind of precursor to the iconic suit. Not just from a cost standpoint, considering that he doesn't come from money exactly, but he's treading uncharted grounds, making this up as he goes along. So he's not planning to fight crime or be a long-time pro wrestler. This stunt he's pulling is just meant to be a one and done to make some money. So throwing together something cheap in a spur of the moment makes sense. We had talked about different things and the idea was Peter put this costume together out of what he had lying around or what he could easily get his hands on and just, you know, did a drawing on a sweatshirt and threw on some sweatpants that were the right colors and these shoes and then wore those like motorcycle gloves and this movie of Spider-Man which we tried to make it it was important to have real good justification where this crazy outfit came from these wrestling acts have the most outrageous outfits and so he designed his own outrageous outfit hence the Spider-Man costume anyway the match gets underway and not realizing that it's going to be a cage fight Peter starts to freak out while Bonesaw gets excited to the point he damn near ruins his tights. But we do get to see the first taste of Bully Maguire in this sequence, and that legend continuously grows even to this day. May the bully bless and keep you. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? Anyway, the fight progresses, and admittedly it could have been done a bit better. Peter starts using his webbing to stay out of Bonesaw's reach, essentially breaking the match, but then for whatever reason, he just drops back down to the ground. And then I just always get a laugh when Spidersense.exe stops working. <laughs> After Bonesaw goes to town on him with a chair, this demented, roided up psychopath decides he wants to reenact The Last of Us Part 2, but then Peter kicks him a couple times, and reverse flips him into the cage wall as hard as he can, knocking out Bonesaw and winning the match, and presumably the money as well. Before I go on, yet another thing I need to address. The use of Peter's webbing having zero care factor on the crowd isn't really an issue. For those of you who seem to have a problem with this, you clearly aren't very well acquainted with pro wrestling, are you? Okay, firstly, no one who is in the crowd sees his face or knows his name, except for the officials in charge of the venue, and one security guard, and that's assuming they even saw him do it. But I'll get back to them. As for the crowd, this is pro wrestling. <laughs> pro wrestling adopted a whole 80s boom of gimmicks by copying comic books. And theatrics and gimmicks are like 75 to 80 percent of what pro wrestling is anyway. Are you kidding me? A guy called Spider Man shooting a sticky white rope from his hand and using it as a grappling hook is actually incredibly tame compared to this. I rest my case. Anyway, Peter goes to collect his reward, but because he actually beats his opponent in two minutes instead of three, the scumbag in charge of the promotion weasels out of paying him on a technicality. Peter tries to reason with him, but the event manager gives him a little taste of the real world. I missed the part where that's my problem. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he was very seriously considering doing to him what he did to Flash. I mean, he knows he can, but he decides not to, likely knowing it would just get him into more trouble. Instead, he just walks away looking defeated. But hey, what goes around comes around. Hey, what the hell? Put the money in the bag. Now, this sequence is almost 100% lifted from the Spider-Man animated series. An armed robber fleeing with a large sum of money from the pro wrestling officials runs straight past Peter who refuses to intervene, instead opting to let the criminal go. Of course, in the film, it's completely understandable why Peter would do something like this. After all, why would he help the man who just completely wronged him? It was revenge, and it felt good, as did this awesome line. You could have taken that guy apart. Now he's going to get away with my money. I missed the part where that's my problem. A little bit of instant karma there, but karma doesn't distinguish. Two wrongs don't make a right, and Peter is about to pay the price for it. 
Before we go on to the next important part, I gotta address another really dumb argument I've heard, and if you're standing, I suggest you sit down and brace yourselves for this one because it is a doozy. Remember when I said the ones who saw Peter's face may or may not have seen him shoot the web in the arena because they were backstage? Well, that's not the issue here because what I've actually heard from some people is because they saw Peter's face, when Spider-Man shows up later on, months later in fact, what would happen is the wrestling officials would make the connection and identify him via a police sketch artist, and this is the best part, because Peter helped the armed gunman escape with the money. What's <laughs> 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 up, man? Now, what's so funny? Just, just let that sink in for a second. Peter lets the armed gunman escape. And this would lead to the wrestling officials reporting and identifying him to the police months later when Spider-Man shows up and Peter's facial features are a distant memory because getting out of the way of an armed gunman supposedly makes you an accomplice. <laughs> Just wow. What were you thinking? What was going on in your mind? Where, where, where did you come up with that? You know, you really need some help, but a, a regular psychiatrist couldn't even help you. You need to go to, like, Vienna or something. That's the kind of help you need. Not the once a week for 80 bucks. No, you need a team. A team of psychiatrists working round the clock. That's what I'm talking about, because that's the only way you're going to get better. Okay, to the people propagating this really stupid argument, you want to know what the actual problem with this scene is? It's the fact that the security guard and the wrestling officials get mad at Peter in the first place when he did nothing wrong. Thanks. What the hell's the matter with you? You let him go. You could have taken that guy apart. Now he's going to get away with my money. And this is an actual mild problem I have with the movie, but it doesn't impact the plot in any way, shape or form, so it doesn't matter. Now, with that out of the way, let's move on to the next scene. Returning to the library, Peter finds his uncle's car nowhere in sight, but he does find a crowd of people and police sirens huddled together on the sidewalk. He goes to investigate it, and you can tell he's got a very ominous feeling about what he's about to find, but nothing could prepare him for the sight of his Uncle Ben dying on the sidewalk from a gunshot wound. The police officer tells him that he was apparently shot by a carjacker. Now this is actually a slight change from the comics where Uncle Ben was actually shot in a burglary attempt on his house, but it serves the same story purpose just as well. Now apparently, and fun fact for those of you who didn't know this, but it was actually Cliff Robertson's idea for Uncle Ben to still be alive, if just barely, to have one last moment with Peter. The original plan was to just have Peter find him dead on the sidewalk. But thankfully, we got to experience this very beautiful and tragic moment between these two characters. I remember it was written originally that Cliff was uh, already expired when um, Toby's character came up to him. But I think it was his idea to say, why don't, why don't we just have me alive to make contact with Peter one last time? It's a great idea. Uncle Ben trying to give Peter some dying words. And what makes this so tragic is that, at least as it appeared to me, Uncle Ben felt so bad for how the conversation between him and Peter ended back in the car. It sounded like, by the tone of his voice, that he was trying to apologize to his nephew. Peter. But as we all know, this sweet old man had nothing to apologize for, and Peter knows that too. But regardless, before he can utter the words, this good, innocent man, the only father Peter had growing up, dies right before his eyes. And Cliff Robertson and Tobey Maguire absolutely nailed this scene. Clichés notwithstanding, this felt about as real as it could get, at least from a movie standpoint. And I love how Peter's face starts off showing heartbreak and sadness but slowly and surely turns to murderous rage as he overhears the police chatter as they found the whereabouts of the carjacker who just killed his uncle. And so Peter goes on a manhunt to take revenge. And it's here we now finally get to the Spider-Man out for revenge sequence, where Peter Parker sets out with nothing but his raw emotion and a desire to kill his uncle's murderer. And you can tell by the way he moves, the aggression and the sheer strength in it, as well as Tobey Maguire's angry grunting that he is out for blood. Now this is mainly a computer generated sequence, as many of you are no doubt well aware, but the animators gave a lot of character to the sequence, and Tobey Maguire, just with his voice, 
acted the shit out of this. Anyway, Spider-Man is wall crawling and jumping over the rooftops, and it's all going to plan until he comes to a point where Peter needs to attempt another spider swing. I just love the look in his eyes here. It's part rage and part fear as Danny Elfman's score slowly sets the mood. And then Peter finally takes the leap of faith and we see Spider-Man swing through the buildings of New York for the first time. And it is glorious, but very intentionally lacks the grace and fluidity that Spider-Man eventually acquires when he becomes more acquainted with this superhero persona that he perfects later on. But for now, he's swinging after the carjacker, vengeance in heart, and the way he swings and attacks sells all of it. All of his pain, all of his rage, and it's honestly an excellent chase sequence. Eventually, Peter causes the gunman to crash into an abandoned dock, and then Peter takes his time stalking his prey, clinging to the shadows, until finally... He seizes his chance and brutalizes him. Peter wails on him until eventually he has the gunman in a corner. And then Peter rips off his mask because he wants the killer to see the rage in his eyes before he gets what's coming to him. The gunman begs for his life but Peter doesn't want to hear it. As Peter prepares to carry out his dark plans for his uncle's killer, a spotlight reveals the truth. The gunman who killed his uncle was the same criminal who robbed the wrestling venue, the one Peter let get away. He let it happen, and it all falls on him. This revelation shakes Peter to his very core. The shock, horror, regret, and shame causes him to almost completely drop his guard. And this is where the robber turns the tables on him, pointing his pistol straight for Peter's head, clearly having no remorse for what he did to his uncle. Admittedly, this is somewhat later retconned in Spider-Man 3, but as far as this scene goes, at the time this movie was made, he is the murderer. And he's about to do it again without a care in the world. But Peter isn't about to make the same mistake twice. And if anything, this is just going to fuel his bloodlust. So at the very last second, Peter uses his spider-like reflexes to disarm the gunman, damn near breaking his arm in the process. And Peter has every intention to kill him, but... The now helpless killer backs off in fear before Peter can deliver the killing blow trips on a pipe, and falls out the window, plummeting to his death. Peter takes a moment to absorb the situation. Though not a killer, he is the reason the gunman is dead, but before Peter can process this, the police close in and he has to flee. He retreats high atop New York's Chrysler building, where he sheds all his tears for his uncle's loss, as well as the regret and shame he feels for his actions. And though he wanted the man who killed Uncle Ben dead, and ultimately got what he thought he wanted, it doesn't make him feel any better, and most, if not all of you no doubt know, Spider-Man doesn't kill, and this sequence is meant to show you precisely why. Peter, in his blind rage, thought he wanted to kill the man who killed his uncle. But, it didn't change or help anything. His uncle is still gone, and there's nothing he can do to change the past. I'll come back to this in a few moments. But Peter returns home finally, ready to face his Aunt May. Now, I've always been unsure as to exactly what is being said in this scene and who is the one breaking the news. I'd find it very hard to believe that Aunt May wasn't alerted of Uncle Ben's murder at this point in time. But what I'm getting at is it doesn't matter who says what or what is said. This tiny, brief, small scene is so powerful because there's no audible dialogue. It's mostly entirely just a visual depiction of family members grieving for a loved one. The only sound being that of Aunt May's crying and much like Uncle Ben's death, it hits right in the feels because it feels so real. And I don't think there's anything even in the slightest bit cliche about this, even by movie standards. Toby and Rosemary, as well as Raimi's decision to keep the scene without dialogue, lend to what makes the scene feel so authentic and real, and slowly the scene simply fades out. Now with that said, tone shift incoming! We go from a heart-wrenching scene between Peter and Aunt May to Green Goblin's maniacal laughter as he bombs the shit out of Oscorp's rival company, Quest Aerospace, along with General Slocum, Oscorp's biggest attractor, in one fell swoop. Green Goblin annihilates all of Norman Osborn's enemies, as well as any and all threats to Oscorp, his company. This also gives the audience just a small taste of how destructive and dangerous the Green Goblin is, 
which is who Peter is eventually going to have to face, even though he's looked into the Green Goblin's eyes before, and is about to again, because it cuts to Peter's graduation from high school. Peter, in addition to his high school diploma, is given a special award for science. Harry rushes to tell him that Norman pulled some strings and they got the apartment in the city that they wanted, but speak of the goblin. Speak of the devil! Norman Osborn interrupts to congratulate his son on finally graduating high school, and I've always liked this little exchange between the two. Yeah. Oh, that's great. You made it. It's not the first time I've been proven wrong. Congratulations. Thanks, Dad. You really get the sense that Norman is proud of his son, despite the fact that he's reluctant to openly show his son affection, because, like I said, there's a disconnect between them. On the other hand, Norman's face practically lights up when he sees Peter and his science achievement. And as I mentioned before, Harry appears to take this somewhat personally. Again, that his father has more of a connection to Peter than he does. And so when he sees MJ and Flash break up, he swoops in like a vulture while Peter is talking to Norman to steal the girl he has a crush on. Again, kind of like he did when he stole Peter's line back at the Spider Labs. But as we all know, Harry has the wrong idea about Peter and his father's relationship because there's no intentional malice or spite behind it. And in this case, Norman, I'd say, was being a little extra compassionate to Peter due to the fact that not long ago, a few weeks at the very most, his uncle passed away. I know this has been a difficult time for you, but I want you to try to enjoy this day. Commencement. The end of one thing, the start of something new. Norman Osborn is actually a good man and does a good thing for Peter here. And it's actually Norman's good deeds and his willingness to try and help Peter out, which is part of why his character's arc is so tragic, because you're seeing a good man and a misunderstood father slowly turn evil due to a personality corruption driven by insanity. After the graduation concludes, Peter quietly heads off to his room, not wanting to celebrate or go out and party like most of the other teenagers are probably doing. Instead, he sits mournfully in his room, thinking about the last conversation he had with the only father he ever knew. The father he lost. And now that his graduation is gone and done with, his childhood and adolescence is over. He's an adult now, and like Uncle Ben said, he has to decide what man he wants to be. These are the years when a man changes to the man he's going to become the rest of his life. Just be careful who you change into. Jeez, I swear, Rosemary Harris's words of encouragement as Aunt May are more powerful than any punch Spider-Man could ever deliver to my gut. Can't help thinking about the last thing I said to him. He tried to tell me something important, and I threw it in his face. You loved him, and he loved you. He never doubted the man you'd grow into. How you were meant for great things. You won't disappoint him. Going forward, this is the point where Aunt May essentially becomes Peter's rock, his guiding light. The one he can turn to when things seem bleakest, and the one person who can steer him back on the straight and narrow. Oh, Harry's in love with her. She's still his girl. Well, isn't that up to her? She doesn't really know who I am. Because you won't let her. You're so mysterious all the time. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble, and finally allows us to die with pride. You start by doing the hardest thing. You forgive yourself. I believe in you, Peter. You're a good person. Like I said, when Peter was on the Chrysler building, he knows revenge won't bring his uncle back. The killer is dead, but this didn't leave Peter feeling fulfilled, it leaves him empty. Nothing he can do will change the past, and so Peter makes a choice to take his uncle's last words to heart. Use them as a code to live by and embrace the responsibility bestowed upon him by his gifts. So that what happened to his uncle doesn't happen to anyone else. And so Peter decides to bring the vision of the costume he originally intended to life to wear a mask to protect his identity and the lives of his loved ones and to finally take up the crime-fighting mantle of Spider-Man. We're then treated to a very amusing, very entertaining montage of Spider-Man fighting crime and a whole bunch of random accounts from New Yorkers who have caught a brief glimpse of him in action or heard about him in the newspaper from some other witnesses. My brother saw him building a nest in the Lincoln Center fountain. Ah, some kind of freaky little something. I could do. 
I see the web, and it's his signature, and, and I know Spider-Man was here. My favorite eyewitness account is the one where he stinks and I don't like him. Okay, my second favorite eyewitness account is the one where a wild Lucy Lawless appears disguised as this random punk rock chick. Much like Bruce Campbell, Lawless is another friend of Sam Raimi who knows him very well from being the lead star in his late 90s adventure series Xena Warrior Princess. And she's also gone on to aid him in some of his other projects along with Bruce Campbell as well such as Ash vs Evil Dead. Great show, by the way. Definitely check it out. Guy with eight hands. Sounds hot. But like I said, the montage is very entertaining, well-paced, and is just plain awesome for two distinct reasons. Firstly, we get to see Spider-Man kick some serious ass, but it's also showing us Spider-Man in his daily elements, helping the city of New York with all sorts of muggings and armed robberies, crimes that warrant a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man's intervention. Not every conflict with Spider-Man has to pertain to his ultimate villains. The small stuff is good too, and it allows us to get more of a well-rounded view of Spider-Man. The second reason why I love this montage is because it gives you a more well-rounded look at the people of New York and how they perceive Spider-Man. The people of New York in this movie is its own kind of character, which has something of an arc throughout this movie and the entire trilogy, in fact which I'll talk about more later. The guy protects us, you know? He protects the people. Also, these Spider-Man animations are gorgeous. Even 20 years later, they are some of my favorite shots in the entire film. But now we come to, hands down, the greatest casting choice in this entire movie, which is saying something since Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin is in this film. And this is arguably the greatest casting choice in a comic book movie to date. J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. Chief Editor at the Daily Bugle. Who is Spider-Man? He's a criminal, that's who he is. A vigilante, a public menace. What's he doing on my front page? Mr. Jameson, this is a page six problem. We have a page one problem, shut up. Fun fact that likely all of you should know at this point, Stan Lee himself wanted to play the part of J. Jonah Jameson. Unfortunately, Stan Lee was simply too old to play the role of J. Jonah Jameson when Spider-Man 1 was finally being made. However, Lee made it absolutely clear that because J.K. Simmons screen tested so well in the auditions, it made him believe that Simmons was the right choice to play Jameson all along. Anyway. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I always wanted to play him in the movie. I was so sorry that by the time the movie was made, I'm too old to play him. And the guy who's playing it in the movies is Phenomenal. wonderful. He did it better than I could have done. And that's very high praise. That's for saying me. a lot for you, yes. Anyway, um, what a legend. And this won't be the last time I speak about Stan Lee in this video. Anyway, Jameson is pissed because his editors are insistent on having Spider-Man as the front page headline for this week's issue of The Bugle. We get introduced to Betty Brant, played by Elizabeth Banks, still early in her career. Hoffman, played by Ted Raimi, brother of the director. And Bill Nunn as Robbie Robertson. I love how the scene starts while the bugle is in the middle of trying to meet its deadline when things are busiest. And you get to see Jameson when he's as pissed off as he can be. They're really important clients. They can't wait. They're about to. She just needs to know if you want the chintz or the chenille in the dining room. Whichever one's cheaper. I think I read or heard somewhere that J.K. Simmons just sat down in the middle of a newspaper publisher for several days just observing things so he could get an idea of what it was actually like and yeah I'd say it worked wonders for the performance he gave. Well done Mr. Simmons. Anyway Jameson is skeptical about endorsing Spider-Man on the front page thinking he's a masked criminal inflicting terror on New York but at the same time he can't deny the attention of a story like this when Robbie tells him they're selling out papers left right and center. Something goes wrong and this creepy crawler is there. Look at that. He's fleeing the scene. What's that tell you? We sold out four printings. Sold out. Every copy. Tomorrow morning, Spider-Man, page one, with a decent picture this time. In addition to that, and I'll come back to this briefly in a few minutes, but Robbie tells him, despite the fact they want to put him on the front page, they can't get a decent picture of him. Spider-Man shows up out of nowhere and disappears like a ghost. And Jameson, as tenacious as ever, tells him to put out an ad for freelance photographers to bring him photos. But he's not going to spread the good word about Spider-Man. Quite the opposite, in fact. He intends to paint his actions how he sees it, which is in the most negative way possible. The media and their agendas, folks. Welcome to reality. Put an ad on the front page. Cash money for a picture of Spider-Man. He doesn't want to be famous, and I'll make him infamous. Love that fucking line. Now we cut back to Peter, who has another chance encounter with Mary Jane as she exits the diner she's recently started working at. 
Something I want to point out is how much Peter has grown so far since acquiring his powers. See, the first time he encounters Mary Jane after he gets bitten by the spider, he caught her attention when he stopped her from falling, but then he froze in front of her, unable to get his words out, which came across as incredibly awkward to her. And this is even after he tried rehearsing what he might say to her if he ever had the courage to walk up to her and strike up a conversation so that he wouldn't get tongue-tied. But unfortunately, the first time that didn't work. The next time, however, it was another chance encounter where the two just happened to cross paths with each other as neighbours, something that Mary Jane instigated, but only because she felt embarrassed, and that time Peter didn't freeze. Instead, I'd say he knocked it out of the park. But this time, however, Peter feels confident and assertive enough to chase after Mary Jane and out of nowhere strike up a conversation with her. MJ, it's me, Peter. Hi. Hey. <sighs> What are you doing around here? I'm, uh, I'm begging for a job. And you can tell by her reaction, it isn't just surprise. She's genuinely thrilled to see him, especially after the shit day she's having, when her manager comes out soon after, much like her father, chases her down, out of the diner, just to talk to her like she's trash. You draw a short six dollars. Next time that happens, I'm gonna take out your check. Excuse me, Miss Watson, I'm talking to you. Hey! Yes, Enrique, okay? I get you. Well, you better not happen no more, you hear me? Don't roll your eyes at me. But Peter, once again, renders no judgment. Instead, just focuses on the positive, telling her how thrilled he is that she's heading to an audition and that she's actively striving to be who she wants to be. That's great, MJ. You're doing it. You're living your dream. Some dream, huh? Well, that's nothing to be embarrassed about. But sadly, this conversation acts as something of a knife to the heart for Peter when Mary Jane tells him not to tell Harry about her working in some crappy diner since being an Osborne, he comes from incredibly high-class living and wouldn't approve. Peter is initially confused until Mary Jane tells him that she and Harry are officially dating. Don't tell Harry. Don't tell Harry. Aren't you guys living together? We're going out, didn't he tell you? <laughs> oh yeah, right. The nerve of that prick. And then Harry actually has the balls to ask Peter to help him with some of his college homework. What a backstabbing rat bastard. Look, man, I'm glad you're here. I need your help. I'm really lost. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. No, I, uh... Nah, but for real, Harry tells Peter he meant no malice by this later on. It was just as simple as he had a crush on her too, and Peter simply didn't act on his. Like, Peter, I, I should have told you about us. You should know I'm crazy about her. It's just, you know, you never made a move. You're right. I didn't. And while that's true, I refuse to believe yet again, given the timing and not to mention the secrecy, that it wasn't partially due to Peter's son-like relationship to Harry's father. And that father-son relationship with Norman Osborn is what Harry wants more than anything in the world. And this is very telling because despite his feelings for MJ, his relationship to her is hindered by the fact that he's also using her to gain his father's approval. Really shows where his priorities are at, and why the relationship with MJ ultimately doesn't work out for Harry, but I'll get back to that later on. Peter, on the other hand, doesn't see Mary Jane that way at all. Aside from his genuine affection for Mary Jane, unlike Harry, Peter is actually from the same world as her. I mean, hell, they were neighbours who grew up ten feet from each other. So of course Peter isn't judgmental about where Mary Jane works simply to make ends meet. I, I think he'd hate the idea of my waiting tables. I think it was low or something. That's not low. You have a job. You know, Harry, he doesn't live on a little place I like to call Earth. <laughs> anyway, MJ leaves the conversation feeling much better about herself, even offering to hang out at some point. Peter reciprocates, but far more forwardly than she did, which is why she pauses and gives him this curious look and so he wisely backtracks well I'll, I'll, I'll come by and have some of your moon dance coffee someday and i won't tell harry no don't tell harry i won't i won't tell harry also some very heavy foreshadowing here especially since when harry actually does find out that there's chemistry between these two it leads to a domino effect that ends up getting his father killed ultimately killing any chance of the one relationship he's always wanted. And this moment is obviously echoed by Norman Osborn's last words. Peter, don't tell Harry. And I won't tell Harry. No, don't tell Harry. I won't. I won't tell Harry. 
also, fun fact, Norman Osborn's final words were not initially in the final script, and Sam Raimi decided to insert this little callback in a reshoot, not just to pay off the foreshadowing from earlier, but also to inform the reason behind Peter's decision to keep Norman's alter ego a secret. This shot of Willem coming up was actually shot later, this one. You can tell because he was already, already in another show, and he had to wear a wig. Don't tell Harry. <laughs> We just wanted him, the reason we redid that shot was we wanted him to say, don't tell Harry. Rather than it being an act of kindness, Peter performs not telling Harry. We wanted him to fulfill the last wish of Norman Osborn, this man who had been the surrogate father to him, mm -hmm. so that he had an obligation and a friendship to perform these last acts and to keep this dark secret. We'll talk more about that later as well. We then cut to Peter in Harry's apartment, and once again we see Harry frustrated that Norman has spent his weekly visit primarily on the phone, likely dealing with a whole bunch of military contract offers after Green Goblin bombed the shit out of Aerospace's prototype. Anyway, like I said, Harry has some nerve to ask Peter for help with his college assignments after backstabbing him with MJ. Storm and Norman's making his weekly inspection. Spent half of it on the phone. Look, man, I'm glad you're here. I need your help. I'm really lost here. But he does notice Peter is feeling down in the dumps, unbeknownst that it's due to the revelation about Harry and MJ's relationship. But Peter lies to Harry, not looking to start a confrontation, at least not yet. But in addition to this, Sam Raimi treats the fans of the comics to a neat little line mentioning one of the Spider-Man franchise's most renowned characters. You won't see Doc Ock in this, but you will see a cameo, one other villain at least, maybe two. Look like you just got second place in the science fair. No, I, uh, I was late for work and Dr. Connors fired me. You were late again? Dr. Connors being one of Peter's mentors, as well as also one of his mainline villains, the Lizard. But that's not the only fan service mention of a Spider-Man character, because back at the Bugle, and I did say I would mention this, were treated to the mention of yet another famous Spider-Man character. Problem is, we don't have a decent picture. Eddie's been on it for weeks, we can barely get a glimpse of him. It's subtle, but Robbie was actually talking about Eddie Brock, another one of Peter's initial antagonists, who would later become the villain slash anti-hero known as Venom. Now these lines are undoubtedly in the context of Spider-Man 1, simply for fan service, and it's appreciated, but it does later impact the continuity of its sequels. Since Dr. Connors in Spider-Man 2 isn't actually Peter's employer, instead he's one of his university professors. Wow, Dr. Connors. Sorry. Where were you headed, Parker? To your class. My class is over. See me standing here? Your paper on Fusion is still overdue. I know, I'm, I'm planning to write it on Dr. Otto Octavius. Though I suppose it was possible that Peter was employed on campus helping him with his research, but there's no mention of that in the sequel and... That certainly didn't look to impact their relationship at all, the fact that he was fired. So it's hard for me to give the benefit of the doubt here. I'm pretty sure that this was a small bit of continuity glossed over, but the way Eddie Brock is introduced in Spider-Man 3 is far more blatant with breaking continuity, since despite it being over two years in the future, Eddie Brock was only just hired at the Daily Bugle. Who are you? You hired him last week. Freelance. I did? What's that smell? It's Brock, sir. Edward Brock Jr. So even though this isn't the fault of Spider-Man 1, it is somewhat frustrating that Raimi didn't follow up on what was set up. However, it is perfectly understandable why these inserts were so short-sighted, because in actuality, Raimi wasn't really intending to set anything up, since there was no greenlit sequel during the process of writing the script for Spider-Man 1. One of the nice things about uh, our ongoing soap opera, something like Spider-Man, obviously will have sequels. I am signed on for second and third, yeah. I'm excited about it. I, I'm looking forward to seeing where the character goes. Yes. I mean, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing one, or if they do, that I will be in it. But if they choose, so I, I'm in it. Oh, yes, they already have it planned. So, yes, I'm sure there will be sequels. Thank you so much. The second script is starting to be written, but I haven't had a chance to work on it yet. The sequel, which they're working on now, and then the following sequels, they will all have visuals that'll be breathtaking. And that's why I can, somewhat, find it forgivable. Especially since Raimi didn't even want Venom in the third movie, and to his credit, aside from the casting choice, actually did a pretty damn good and faithful job with bringing Venom to life. 
Anyway, Norman presses Peter on the identity of Harry's new girlfriend, showing genuine enthusiasm to meet her. But Harry is hesitant, at least for the moment. I love how Peter and Norman, as if to be on the same frequency as each other, give Harry this glare, insinuating with their eyes that he should quit pussyfooting around and come clean. Harry, on the other hand, is eager to change the subject and tells his dad that Peter could use help finding a job. Norman offers, but Peter reluctantly turns him down. And I love Norman Osborne's line here. You want to make it on your own, Steve. That's great. You can really see the admiration Norman has for Peter here, probably seeing a lot of himself in Peter since Norman presumably started Oscorp from practically nothing. <sighs> I started this company. We'll get to that in a second. Peter, despite being a poor boy from Queens, wants to find his own work and take no shortcuts, which is commendable. And like I said, since Norman sees a lot of himself in Peter, it's just another way that they can connect on a level that Norman can't with his own son, since Harry didn't have a similar upbringing to Norman. Harry grew up very privileged, hated school, flunked out of every private school Norman sent him to, grew up in a New York penthouse, and Norman can easily, with his wealth and influence, get him over any speed bumps he's likely to come across. And once again, you can tell this really pisses Harry off. And I've said this several times now, but again, it's obvious Harry sees Peter like a brother, but he undoubtedly harbors a lot of resentment as well, which adds an extra layer of depth to their dynamic as characters, and this does, to some extent, inform several of Harry's decisions against Peter, malicious or not, throughout the movie. But moving forward, Peter spots Jameson's ad that the Daily Bugle is desperate for pictures of Spider-Man, and just like that, he's found his job. The next sequence is pretty awesome, as Spider-Man, with some excellent grace and athleticism, dispatches another group of armed robbers in what's a pretty cool fight scene, and he does this all while smiling for the cameras he set up, which makes the scene somewhat hilarious at the same time. And this is followed up by even more hilarity as Jameson compliments Peter's excellent Spidey photography. The crap. 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 Mega crap. Peter ultimately gets paid, but it's not until he delivers the photos that he finds out Jameson's true intentions is to condemn Spider-Man's actions and not celebrate them. And suddenly Peter isn't so sure about what he's doing, but Jameson assures him everything's golden and sends him on his way. Meat! I'll send you a nice box of Christmas meat. Best I can do. Get out of here. Bring me more photos. And then we get some classic Toby as Peter Parker, still dorky as ever, attempts what can only very loosely be described as a flirt. Thank you. I'm Peter Parker. I'm a photographer. Yes, I can see that. Then the movie cuts to Oscorp, and turns out Oscorp is doing very well indeed. And Norman Osborn, the grouchy old fuck, is actually in a good mood for a change. Well, that is until... We're selling the company. What? So apparently Quest Aerospace wants to aggressively expand and absorb Oscorp after their base and most expensive military assets was bombed to oblivion. So just spitballing here, but I'm guessing the thought process is that they'd rather dedicate their finances to acquiring Oscorp's assets instead of trying to make their own from scratch. But the catch is Norman, the CEO of the company and its founder, gets ousted so that there's no power struggle. They made a tender offer we can't ignore. Why wasn't I told? The last thing they want is a power struggle with entrenched management. The deal is off if you come with it. The board expects your resignation in 30 days. On the other hand, this is while the board of directors and the investors get to keep their positions and get all the profit from the merger. Though I'd imagine Norman Osborne would have a sizable investment in the company and would get a large payout from the deal, but point stands, Norman is rightfully pissed, especially since these weasels went behind his back. Even Max. Now, I don't know much about Max. None of us get the chance to. But Norman looks and pleads to him like he's a considered longtime friend of Norman's who betrayed him. But Max tells him that the board is unanimous, meaning he went against Norman willingly as well. In light of this revelation, that his company is being sold, Norman, bewildered at this turn of events, can't contain his rage and just completely goes off on these guys. But you can't do this to me. <sighs> I started this company. You know how much I sacrificed? Honestly, real talk here, 
Norman Osborn's sacrifice quote hits very differently as an adult. Like, as a child, I memed on it loads because I thought it was funny, and because I thought it was incredibly over the top, but being older and having a better understanding of how the world works, this line is actually quite heartbreaking. Because you realise Norman is actually referring to Harry here. And it shows, despite him not having the best relationship with his son, he does care about Harry immensely, and that is one of his biggest regrets in life that he wasn't able to have the relationship he wanted with him. And he did it all for Oscorp. Oscorp is everything to him, and as I previously stated, Norman can't let Oscorp fail, and this is why. He can't let it fail because in his eyes, his sacrifices were all for naught. The regret he feels for a lack of a close relationship with his son is, in a tragic way, the driving force for what causes Norman to become the Green Goblin in the first place. Or at least, that's half of his driving force. I'll get back to the other half a bit later. But when the scene comes to a close and the chairman of the board tells Norman he's out, putting it very mildly here, Norman has other plans. You're out, Norman. Urge to kill rising. And just for comparison's sake, much like back in the laboratory when the general threatened Oscorp, Norman looks defeated and scared, and at first that's what Norman does here when Max and the chairman give him the news. Norman looks heartbroken, defeated, and bewildered. That is until the Green Goblin smiles back. I just wanted to mention that because I think it's a nice indication for growth and change within the character as the story progresses. But then we cut to the Oscorp Unity Day Festival. Not much really to say about it other than I've always liked the song being sung by the stage singer. It's jazzy, I don't know, I find it nostalgic, sue me. But then we meet up with Peter trying to get some interesting photos for the Bugle, but gets a tad discouraged when he sees one of his photos on the front page for a story discrediting Spider-Man. Later on, he tries to get some photos of the Oscorp board of directors, since the festival is being hosted by them. But he pauses to find Harry and MJ being together as a couple. However, not all is what it seems. As I previously mentioned, Harry is more obsessive with how MJ is dressed and what his father will think of her, rather than just enjoying being with her. And MJ feels like she's being treated as some kind of trophy girlfriend. Which is why when Harry goes to kiss her, she denies him. MJ, why didn't you wear the black dress? Just, I wanted to impress my father. He loves black. Well, maybe he'll be impressed no matter what. You think I'm pretty. I think you're beautiful. Ouch! Peter's attention is broken when his spider sense tingles at incoming danger. Meanwhile, Harry asks Max if Norman is going to be at the festival, and this two-faced prick smiles back at Norman's own son after backstabbing his father, telling him that Norman is probably not going to come. Oh, he's gonna show up alright! And then we finally get this awesome grand entrance of the Green Goblin flying in on his glider, circling his prey, and finally strikes at the Oscorp board of directors, practically demolishing the whole balcony. Peter watches on being the only one who isn't terrified. The Oscorp balcony begins to collapse onto innocent people, and Peter almost blows his secret identity by webbing two potential victims out of the way amidst the chaos. Some people that I'm probably going to have to state the obvious for are wondering why no one saw him do this. Well, obviously no one saw him because of the mass hysteria going on caused by the flying green terrorists. You may have missed that. There was actually a tiny scene cut here where two small children by sheer chance happened to catch Peter doing this, and it's honestly kind of an adorable little scene. Peter urges them to keep quiet with a simple hand gesture before running off to save the day. Personally, I wish it was kept in. And no, even if it was, it doesn't do any damage because, like I said before, you kind of got to have evidence of him doing Spider-Man stuff in order to out his identity. Smartphones don't exist yet, it's the analog age, where photography was far more scarce, and two small children who don't even know who Peter is ain't gonna cut it. We also get a tiny Stan Lee cameo in this sequence, but also fun fact, Stan Lee originally had a slightly extended scene where he actually mentions the X-Men. Hey, how about these? They wore them in the X-Men. And if sources are to be believed, apparently Hugh Jackman after X-Men 2000 was meant to have a cameo at some point in this movie, but it never came to be. Personally, I'm kind of glad this didn't happen in retrospect, even though I love Hugh Jackman. 
But I don't know. Maybe it's just because we've had more than our fair share of cameos in the past 10 years. But that said, Green Goblin makes another pass at the balcony and utters this iconic line. And he just fucking vaporizes the board of directors. Admittedly, in retrospect, this comes off as slightly goofy, but this is the kind of cheesiness you'd quite often see in the movies from the late 90s, early 2000s. And like I said at the beginning, Spider-Man is no exception. Though I'll briefly come back to Green Goblin's odd selection of weaponry later. Meanwhile, Mary Jane has fallen onto a large chunk of the balcony that's starting to break off. Harry tries to save her, but gets knocked out by a piece of falling debris. Oddly enough, Goblin, for some reason, takes a very creepy interest in trying to terrify the living hell out of Mary Jane. And then this random chick says the line we've all been waiting for. It's Spider-Man! Yeah, I love how this movie has a knack for giving these guys great entrances. Anyway, Spider-Man saves a random boy from getting crushed. Goblin surrenders to the police officers. Admittedly, without being too pedantic here, it is a little weird that they don't try to shoot him here, despite having their weapons drawn. This would be the example of a bad movie cliche. He has the suit and the helmet. I'd imagine it would be somewhat resistant to bullets, since it's meant to be used to fly the glider. And Raimi could have just had them fire a few rounds at him and had them bounce off. But oh well, after the cops get their asses handed to them, Spider-Man tries to put a stop to it. And goddamn, this is such an anime moment. Ah! Uh, what? No way! What is with this movie chalking up these awesome lines? But more to the point, this is the first time since Peter acquired his powers that he's come across a match for his strength. And he, for the first time since becoming Spider-Man, has to retreat. Goblin chases him down using the guns and missiles on his glider, and Spider-Man narrowly escapes up onto the large parade balloons above them. But before the two can re-engage with each other, Spider-Man can hear Mary Jane screaming in the distance, and so goes to try and save her, but Goblin intercepts him, crashes him into Oscorp Tower, but Spider-Man manages to slip away, blind Goblin, and sabotage his glider. Goblin now has to retreat, and utters a line as true to comic book writing as it could ever be. In any other movie, it would sound ridiculous, but this felt organic because this entire movie, despite its realistic elements, has been true to its cheesy comic book origins. In other words, they put the work in to make sure this dialogue and line delivery works well, and it paid off. Anyway, Mary Jane falls and Spider-Man dives after her, uttering the line, Okay, before I get some pseudo in the comments saying, but Peter just blew his cover by calling her Mary Jane. No, he did not. How, you might wonder? Well, for those of us with common sense and anyone with a working set of eyes and ears, they know exactly why. Because Mary Jane didn't hear it. The very fact that she has no reaction to it should be enough of a hint for you short of riding it on a baseball bat and cracking you over the skull with it. At most, all she could hear was the sound of Spider-Man's voice, but not the specifics of what he was saying. Because all of this is happening while bombs are going off, while there's pandemonium in the streets and sirens blazing, while Mary Jane herself is screaming her lungs out, and while she's falling. So there's no chance she accurately heard him call her name out. Mary Jane! Help! A panda stands between you and you're destiny. What? Prepare yourself for a hot... Also, before you say, well, what about when they're hanging off the bridge and Spider-Man calls her Mary Jane? Yeah, that's after the hospital scene where Peter tells Mary Jane that he spoke to Spider-Man about her. So it wouldn't make a difference since in her eyes, Spider-Man knows who she is because of Peter. Anyway, now that that's been squashed, Spider-Man at the last possible moment saves Mary Jane from the fall and he swings off with her to the applause of the entire crowd for his actions, as Danny Elfman's enchanting score plays in the background. But I'm sure there's a whole bunch of straw-grasping morons out there who will ignore all that awesomeness, because, oh look, Mary Jane's hair is very subtly blowing the wrong way as she's swinging with Spider-Man. The scene is totally ruined. No, 
The scene is awesome. The music is beautiful. Get over it. Peter drops Mary Jane off on one of New York's most famous rooftops. And I'm sure the locals in the comment section can tell us ignorant folk what it's called. And this rooftop garden has been used in other awesome Marvel superhero productions as well. Yes, we love you, Daredevil. Anyway, Spider-Man briefly gives Mary Jane one of his quippy remarks, but she stops him from leaving to ask who he is. She gets a tiny hint when Spider-Man subtly changes his voice, ridding it of all its confidence and swag and telling her in Peter's shy, somber voice that she knows who he is. But before she gets too suspicious, he once again wisely backtracks. It's taking the subway. Wait! Who are you? You know who I am. I do. Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Now you'll notice that after Spider-Man saves her, Mary Jane's immediate reaction is to ask for his identity. But like I said before, at this point, her character is completely missing what's most important about Spider-Man. That it doesn't matter who he is, the point is that he's out there saving people like her. She later comes to this realization when she and Spider-Man have that very famous upside down kiss in the rain, which I'll get to, but for now, she's so excited and intrigued by the mystery man who saved her life, all she can think about is who he is. Even practically orgasming about him on the phone to Harry, who's supposed to be her boyfriend, remember? But then again, Mary Jane wasn't exactly thrilled with Harry since he was way more focused on impressing his father than he was on her. Harry comes clean to Peter about Mary Jane, and Peter actually admits that it is his fault for not making a move on MJ sooner. But like I said, for other reasons as well, Harry still very blatantly stabbed him in the back. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Anyway, Peter reflects on just what the hell happened at the festival, and just who is the masked green hover glider that he encountered, and when will he strike again? And speaking of which, we cut to Norman Osborn's penthouse, the man's enjoying a nice scotch on the rocks, or some rich man's alcoholic drink, and he starts hearing a very familiar voice in his head speaking to him. Norman looks freaked out and scared, wondering who or what this voice is, but the voice tells him to quit acting like he doesn't know. Don't play the innocent with me. You've known all along. Obviously, Norman Osborn has gone mad. We know this by now, but what we don't know is how aware Norman Osborn is of his actions. It was left somewhat ambiguous up till this point, but this scene sheds a whole new light on his insanity. But before I get into that, another side point. See, Sam Raimi's Green Goblin has been criticized largely for the design of his helmet as opposed to the green mask and purple hood that he wears in both the source material and the animated series. Now personally, I never had a problem with the suit, or the helmet for that matter, from a design point of view. Sam Raimi wanted things to be somewhat realistic and practical for the character, and Green Goblin having a militarized green flight suit designed to handle extreme g-force and potentially having to absorb crash damage is very practical indeed. I think in some ways the Green Goblin was more challenging to somehow have it reference and relate to Norman Osborn and what he's doing. So because he's a scientist and he's developed the glider and maybe the suit had to be a little more high tech so that it had some relationship to the glider. We felt that the Goblin's outfit could have been designed as a, a weapon of war, a battle suit. So we could justify the green, we could justify the armor plating and like ancient weapons of war, we felt that it may have a mask, something frightening to strike terror into the hearts of uh, the enemy. I thought that the thing we had to retain about the Green Goblin was that kind of screaming face. And it seemed to me important that whatever we did with the rest of the outfit, we had to somehow retain this maniacal scream. But the fact that Norman designed a goblin-like helmet for himself, I found this to be incredibly bizarre. But see, there's a nice visual detail in his penthouse that clues you into one of his more subtle character traits. And that is that Norman Osborn has a fascination with tribal masks and thus designed himself a scary looking helmet which resembled that of a goblin. And when I picked up on this while watching the commentary, I thought it was brilliant because it answered a question I'd had in my mind about the movie for about 20 years now. Now remember, if you look in this room, you'll see a, a wide variety of masks that Karen O'Hara our set decorator went to great pains uh, to get. Some of them are quite valuable and uh, and they're all quite beautiful. They did a really great job uh, 
you know, just about the background stuff of telling the story of his love of masks and tribal masks. As for the missing purple cloak, Sam Raimi made sure to reference it later when Goblin ambushes Spider-Man in the burning building trap he set for him. But the last criticism against Green Goblin's look that I've heard at least is that he looks too much like a Power Ranger. And at first I was inclined to agree, but that was until I saw Razor Fist's video on the first Daredevil season on Netflix, and he brings up an excellent point about this. And can I just say that I don't get the hate for the Daredevil suit? Actually, scratch that, I do. Because there was never once an adaptation of a superhero on TV or on film where belly aching bitches have been adequately satisfied with the outfit. Just admit it out loud. For fuck's sake, Spider-Man's outfit is basically copied and pasted from the comics, and as we all remember, back in 2002, people still fucking complained en masse. Spider-Man is ripped for her pleasure. What's with the jersey fabric? I don't know, his balls sweat. It looks like fucking Spider-Man. And granted, this show has taken slightly more artistic license than Spider-Man, but I think it's perfectly fine. And more to the point, there's no reason to believe it won't visually evolve as Season 2 progresses. And can we declare a moratorium on the fucking Power Ranger comparisons for the foreseeable future? Let's establish this one fact in crystal clear fucking English, please. Green Goblin doesn't look like a Power Ranger. The Power Rangers look like superheroes, because that's exactly what Tokusatsu is ripping the fuck off. On top of that... Sam Raimi did intend for a more faithful adaptation of the Green Goblin's appearance, but unfortunately for some comic book fans, he was limited by the technology of the time, and Raimi and his production team couldn't get the original Green Goblin design to convincingly work. In addition to the limits of technology, one of the other reasons the original Green Goblin mask was scrapped is because the production team was worried that it would traumatize the younger audience. Honestly, I'm surprised Raimi got away with as much as he did with this movie's maturity level in the final cut, but Sony wanted this to be a mass appeal movie, and yeah, if you look at the early test footage for the original mask, it's not hard to see why it was scrapped. But personally, I'm grateful it didn't happen. Sure, Green Goblin doesn't exactly resemble the comic or animated series for that matter, but he's still one cool, scary-looking, badass motherfucker who's still recognizable as the Green Goblin, and that's enough. And that's all it ever needed to be. Back to the scene in question, Norman finally recognizes where the voice is coming from, as he eyes himself in the mirror, and thus we get one of the most memorable scenes and best acting performances by Willem Dafoe as he switches between both his identities off and on again and again while he's hitting a light switch. And it's absolutely glorious. The board members, you killed them. We killed them. We? Remember your little accident in the laboratory? The performance enhancers, bingo. As the conversation continues, it's made quite clear that Norman was somewhat aware of what was happening, but his mind was hazy on the details. It's difficult to say at this point where exactly his level of awareness starts and ends, but what's being made clear is now that the personalities are consciously communicating with each other, they are growing closer and closer to constantly overlapping. This is also quite faithful to the animated series, as it's a clear indication that Norman's madness is getting worse. Osborne, aren't you finished yet? Almost. Be patient. I can't guarantee its stability. <laughs> Spare me your warnings, Osborne. Turn it on. What about Spider-Man? He knows about our connection. Indeed, Spider-Man is the only man on Earth who knows that the Green Goblin and Norman Osborn are allies. Also, remember when I said Norman's driving force for not letting Oscorp fail was driven by his regret for how he sacrificed his relationship with Harry? And I called it half of his reasoning for doing so. Well, this is the other half. The Green Goblin alter ego is essentially Norman Osborn unhinged and acting on his basic instincts and most innate character traits. What do you want? To say what you won't. To do what you can't. To remove those in your way. And so Goblin revealed why he did the things he did, and it was to fuel Norman's ambition and his power-hungry nature, a key character trait of his. 40,000 years of evolution, and we barely even tapped the vastness of human potential. Me, your greatest creation. Bringing you what you've always wanted. Power beyond your wildest dreams, and it's only the beginning. 
The scene closes out with Goblin revealing his intentions for the only one who can stop them, and what plans he has for Spider-Man. And now we cut back to the Daily Bugle for more awesome J. Jonah Jameson, who's gloating about his journalistic genius for dubbing the green terrorist weirdo on the glider as the Green Goblin. Call the patent office, copyright the name Green Goblin, I want a corner every time somebody says it. How about green meaning? Jameson basically tells Peter to get lost when he wouldn't let up about Spider-Man saving New York from the Green Goblin and not helping him terrorize it. But moments later, the Daily Bugle is attacked by none other than the Green Goblin himself. Speak to the devil! And he's looking for one of Spider-Man's photographers. You'll notice I said one of Spider-Man's photographers. Since, and this will come up later, it's exhibited in this very movie that Peter isn't the only one who takes Spider-Man's pictures. He just so happens to be the one who gets the best shots of Spider-Man, which is why Jameson uses them, but that's not public knowledge as of yet. And that's why Goblin has to interrogate Jameson. But surprisingly enough, especially on my first viewing, we actually get to know a hell of a lot more about J. Jonah Jameson's character in this scene, who, as previously mentioned, instantly made a fan-favorite first impression thanks to J.K. Simmons. While Peter is defending what Spider-Man did at the Unity Day Festival, he accuses Jameson of slander, and this devious, lovable bastard gives our hero a 101 crash course in journalism. Spider-Man wasn't attacking the city, he was trying to save it. That's slander. It is not. I resent that. Slander is spoken. In print, it's libel. This shows that despite Jameson being an ass, at least he's a professional who takes journalism seriously, and he's not some crooked or corrupt media official. And this is later reinforced in Spider-Man 3, that for all that movie's faults, I can at least give credit to that film for staying true to Jameson's character. Pack your things. Get out of my building. I was just... You're fired! You know we're gonna have to print a retraction now. I haven't printed a retraction in 20 years! Now, that all being said, after Goblin blasts into his office and hoists Jameson up by the throat, he's essentially at Goblin's mercy and is about to die if he doesn't give up his source for Spider-Man's photographs. To have a chance at living, he has to give up Peter to this maniac, this greedy publicity whore just has to give him the name of some freelance photographer, some college student fresh out of high school who means nothing to him. And despite that, Jameson actually holds his tongue. Jameson, you slime! Who's the photographer who takes the pictures of Spider-Man? I don't know who he is. His stuff comes in the mail. You're lying! I swear! Do it. I don't know who he is! You are useless! The dude is essentially staring death in the face and just straight up refuses to give Peter up right in that moment. This goes beyond simple professionalism as a journalist to not give up his sources. You want to talk about heroism? This was an act of heroism. And it shows the audience that Jameson, despite being a cheap, greedy asshole who's head of a newspaper outlet just looking to sell a story, Despite that, Jameson wasn't a heartless bastard. In, you see, in their last moments, people show you who they really are. Anyway, seconds later, Spider-Man shows up and Jameson immediately accuses Spider-Man of being involved with Goblin. But he's silenced by a web to the face. Not exactly the nicest way to repay Jameson for saving your life there, Spidey. But in addition to that, Tobey Maguire shows off Spider-Man's trademark personality and utters one of his famous quippy lines. Hey kiddo, let mom and dad talk for a minute, will ya? And finally, this allows me to address the second criticism against Sam Raimi's Spider-Man and Tobey Maguire. Aside from the organic web shooters, the criticism is that Tobey is a fine enough Peter Parker, but a subpar version of Spider-Man, because he doesn't closely resemble the character enough from the comics. Largely due, once again, to the organic web shooters, which we've already discussed, but also due to the fact that the Spider-Man character that Toby is portraying is quite reserved with his sense of humor and remarks when he's face to face with the bad guys. And in response to that, in regards to Toby Maguire's portrayal of Spider-Man, you know what I have to say to that? Are you fucking kidding me? Seriously? In this movie, Spider-Man for the most part, anyway. When he's face to face with a bad guy, he's always cracking jokes or cracking comic book-like insults. What are you doing up there? Staying away from you. It's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? Jeez. Oh. Oh. Hold it right there. I surrender. Oh boy. Bless you. Set him down, tough guy. <laughs> hey, kiddo. Mm -hmm. Let mom and dad talk for a minute, will ya? I'll be here when you get back. 
Not coming back, Chief. It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. Wrong answer! Oh, great. The only time he doesn't do that is when things get the most serious. Admittedly, this is a bit toned back in Spider-Man 2, due to the fact that A, Spider-Man is absent from a relatively large portion of the movie, and B, that film was predominantly a much deeper character study into Peter Parker, not Spider-Man. And even then, there were instances of Spidey's sense of humor. Several, in fact. Here's your change! You're getting on my nerves. I have a knack for that. Not anymore. And this was even more prevalent in Spider-Man 3. Jigs up, pal. I don't want to hurt you. I guess you haven't heard. I'm the sheriff around these parts. Okay. Fact of the matter is, I always understood why Peter wasn't immediately as openly humorous whilst taking on his Spider-Man persona because he was constantly growing into it. So personally, I didn't mind that he wasn't constantly quipping his ass off like he does in comics or the animated series for that matter. But Raimi made sure to include a modest amount of it without it feeling forced and out of place while still bearing resemblance to the source material. So there you go. Moving on, Goblin decides to kidnap Spidey and so he gasses him out with a sleeper agent. Goblin catches Spider-Man after he falls several stories and kidnaps him to a rooftop where he can converse with him in a civilized manner, or as civilized as you could expect from the Green Goblin. I also love how it's implied how much he respects Spider-Man by the fact that while he's at Goblin's mercy, Goblin doesn't actually even attempt to try and remove Spider-Man's mask. <laughs> Morning sunshine. The way you get out of here, the way you walk free is if I want you to. Know that. Why didn't you take my mask off? Don't give a shit about who you are. You're an amazing creature, Spider-Man. You and I are not so different. I'm not like you. You're a murderer. You got the name is the devil of Hell's Kitchen anyway. I mean, really? I didn't ask for that name. I'm sorry. I see you running from me. I don't do this to hurt people. Yeah, so what is that? Just a job part? I, I don't kill anyone. Is that why you think you're better than me? No. Is that why you think you're a big hero? It doesn't matter what I think or what I am. Well, to each his own. I chose my path. You chose the way of the hero. Goblin seems to be fascinated by the idea of Spider-Man, but he doesn't believe in what Spider-Man is doing. And so he makes his goal abundantly clear. That Goblin thinks being a hero is pointless for a myriad of different reasons and so he wants to corrupt Spider-Man to show him the error of his ways and bring him down to his level. Hell, Goblin even gives him the classic join me villain speech. Sure, it's a bit of a cliche but it's really well done. But I'll tell you one thing about Goblin's speech that was definitely not cliche, especially at the time of this film's release. But the one thing they love more than a hero is to see a hero fail, fall, die trying. In spite of everything you've done for them, eventually they will hate you. Why bother? Sound familiar? You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. In your face, Dark Knight. After Green Goblin leaves Spider-Man on the roof so he can contemplate his decision, we get to see exactly what the Green Goblin was warning him about. Whether or not Spider-Man agrees with his philosophy is irrelevant because the fact of the matter is, Green Goblin is right. And that's what makes the speech so compelling and endlessly rewatchable. But Goblin's philosophy is not without its own flaws as we come to see later in the movie. And so we see the aftermath of the Bugle attack as now J. Jonah Jameson publishes a story where he implicates Spider-Man as an accomplice in the Bugle's attack. And once more, people will believe him because A, he was the one who was attacked, and B, a lie usually makes it halfway around the world before the truth comes out, as the saying goes. Though that's not to say that Jameson was lying, he is a man of principle when it comes to journalism, but given his distaste for Spider-Man and the way the events transpired, it wouldn't be hard for him to assume they could possibly be in cahoots with one another. And so from this point on in the movie, a considerable portion of New York turns on Spidey, as well as the city's law enforcement. Hell, later, and even after he saves an infant from a burning building, a police officer tries to arrest him on sight. We will come back to this a bit later on, but the point is New York hates Spidey and thinks of him as a criminal. The majority is the mob who latch onto a lie, like sheep latching onto their shepherd, 
They believe the truth is whatever they're told, or whatever the news tells them, which is of course a version of the truth. A truth that New York will later see for themselves, the kryptonite, so to speak, of Green Goblin's philosophy against heroism. Before we move on, however, I have heard a colossal dumbass argument about Jameson for this small detail in the movie. You see, after the Bugle was attacked, J. Jonah Jameson publicly outs Peter as Spider-Man's photographer and attaches his name to one of the best shots the Bugle has of the Web Slinger, essentially serving as a wanted poster for the city's outcry for Spider-Man to be brought to justice. Now, apparently... Jameson giving up Peter as one of his sources for Spider-Man's photographs was character assassination. <laughs> you serious? <laughs> wow, you can't make this shit up. Trust me, I wish I was. Because apparently, and this is the logic some people use, Apparently, it contradicted what happens moments ago when Jameson essentially saved Peter by not giving him up to the Goblin. Jameson saved him in the heat of the moment. It was a life or death situation, and the man showed true bravery in the face of death. But he didn't know there was a flying green psychopath looking to kill him for the information, now did he? Is Jameson, or anyone for that matter, going to allow themselves to be targets again? Nope. Fact of the matter is, Goblin had retreated and no one was in any immediate danger, so they could give Peter ample warning to get to safety, and if that wasn't enough, Spider-Man is now wanted by law. I'd imagine Jameson would need to provide the source he was using if it involves finding a felon to legitimize the photo. One of the reasons he fired Eddie Brock and had to print a retraction when the incriminating photos against Spider-Man were proven to be fake. So for those of you out there propagating this bullshit, no, Jameson's character wasn't assassinated. What are you, a moron? Wait, don't answer that. It's rhetorical. You probably needed that pointed out to you as well. Anyway, it cuts to another, this time not so chance encounter between Mary Jane and Peter, who raced across all of New York in several forms of public transport to catch her audition for a soap opera. Peter modestly admits that he went through extreme lengths to make it out there in time, and MJ looks to be taken with it. Once again, someone actually putting in genuine effort just to support her in being her best self. Peter takes his remarks a step too far, however, inquiring about the current relationship status between her and Harry, and so he tries to backpedal to not learn on just how much he's into her, but MJ caught the signals and playfully presses Peter on just what exactly he meant, but Peter wisely just smiles and shrugs it off. How's it going with... Uh, never mind. That's none of my business. It's not? Why so interested? I'm not. You're not? Well, why would I be? I don't know. Why would you be? I don't know. It's another really adorable exchange between the two of them. And then we get one of the most beloved comic references in the entire movie. I better run, Tiger. Face it, Tiger. You just hit the jackpot. Another one of Sam Raimi's love letters to the Spider-Man fans. This is followed, however, by what is and likely always will be the most audience mature scene we are ever going to see in a Spider-Man movie. The four-on-one mugging scene. Peter glimpses a pair of street thugs pursue Mary Jane down a dark alleyway in the middle of the rain. He catches this just before she's out of sight. Credit to Tobey Maguire's acting for conveying everything with a look. As I said, Mary Jane runs for her life down a dark alleyway encountering another two muggers. She's cornered by them, and it's strongly implied that the muggers are going to sexually assault MJ. <laughs> Yeah, we are never getting anything close to a scene like this in any other Spider movie ever again. However, that said, the very dark implications of what was going to happen until Spider-Man intervened lent to the authenticity of the scene. And like many others that preceded it in this movie, it felt real. And shit gets even more real when Spider-Man lets his punches fly and doesn't pull a single one of them. When he shows up, he absolutely demolishes these guys. In addition to how he fights, he also throws caution to the wind, jumping into the fray without even taking the time to put his mask on. Completely risking exposure, it's just fortunate that it was dark and rainy when this happened. And before I get some dipshit in the comments saying, 
Well, why didn't Mary Jane recognize him then and there? After all, look how bright it is. Because, genius, and this falls under common sense by the way, if the scene was as dark as it was going to be in real life, we the audience wouldn't have had a fucking clue of what was going on. Only we the audience can tell it's Peter fighting these goons, because to Mary Jane, it's damn near pitch black, not to mention the rain. Speaking of which, the rain lent heavily to the scene's atmosphere, and it was a perfect choice, first, to add to Mary Jane's horrible predicament, but secondly, in addition to that, it also adds as like a tranquil sort of backdrop to the beautiful moment she shares with Peter. Er, I mean, Spider-Man. You are amazing. Some people don't think so. But you are. Nice to have a fan. Of course, she gets a teensy hint that it's really Peter under there. So, he just came by? I was in the neighborhood. I needed to see a friendly face. I think I have a superhero stalker. I was in the neighborhood. But like I said, it doesn't matter to her who's behind the mask. The point is that Spider-Man is out there watching over and protecting people like her. Fun fact, the initial way this scene was meant to play out was a little different. Sam Raimi initially intended for the camera to pan off to the right, insinuating the kiss happened off screen. Without going into too much detail, the point of the matter is that Kirsten Dunst didn't actually have to kiss Toby in the rain, but Dunst being the professional she is, along with the excellent chemistry she had with Toby Maguire, prompted her to kiss him anyway. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering how I know this was the case, well, see, on the Spider-Man DVD, there's this nice little viewing option where they left a bunch of fun facts that describes the circumstances around how certain scenes were filmed as well as the cast members. So on the off chance that I'm wrong about this, be sure to blame that source. And thus, we, the audience, were treated to one of the most iconic romance scenes in modern cinema. And it certainly made the rounds among other pieces of media, from comedies to soap operas, using it as a point of reference for romance scenes involving their characters. Just another moment that earns this exquisite movie its incredibly high regarded pedestal. And I have read you were breathless in one scene. Can you tell me something more about that? Sure. Yeah, it was the scene, the upside down kiss. And there was rain pouring up my nose, or down my nose if you consider the fact that I was upside down. And uh, the mask is on, and then Kirsten pulls the mask up to hear it. It's blocking my uh, air passage there, so I couldn't breathe. And then she's kissing me, and she's blocking the air passage there, so there's nowhere else to breathe from. Uh, and I was, you know, practically suffocating, and I would have to suck air out of the side of my mouth. <sighs> but regarding the chemistry between Toby and Kirsten, well, see, after further digging, it turns out Raimi revealed in an interview back in 2007, the two were actually dating for a short time during the filming of the first movie. In fact, he was worried a breakup between the two would destroy their chemistry for the Spider-Man sequel. And as we all know at this point, those fears were certainly unfounded. Alright, time for me to make this crystal clear. There is a very good reason why Mary Jane did not recognize Peter's voice in this scene and others as well. Several, in fact. Firstly and most obviously, Peter had altered his voice somewhat while wearing the mask and suit. Yeah, sorry it wasn't as overly pronounced as Christian Bale's voice in The Dark Knight. This city just showed you that it's full of people ready to believe in good. But hey, how dare they use a bit of subtlety in this movie. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to use this example, but to make an even greater point, I'm going to black out the visuals. Really? Well, that's perfect. You're awesome in all this cool place. What are you doing up there? Staying away from you. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? Jeez. That seems a little low. <sighs> Hold on! Ah! Pete's taking the subway. Don't mind us, she just needs to use the elevator. It's me again. Hey! How was your audition? How'd you know? The hotline. Your mom told my aunt, told me. You have a knack for getting in trouble. <laughs> you have a knack for saving my life. Bike messenger. Knock me down. It's true, all the terrible things they say about him? No, no. Not Spider-Man. Not a chance in the world. Listen! I need you to climb down! I can't! Yes, you can! I can't. And you'll clearly see a distinct difference between Spider-Man's voice and Peter Parker's. Now, if you're still not convinced, reason two. 
Studies have shown that voice recognition is much more difficult than facial recognition, especially if the individual in question isn't an everyday person in the subject's life, which would certainly qualify Mary Jane and Peter in this instance. Yes, the two were neighbours growing up nearby one another and in school together, but the film went above and beyond to show that they were never close with each other. Although that had recently started to change, but despite that, and to put it in perspective, Mary Jane is far more acquainted with Harry's voice since they are currently seeing each other. Hell, Mary Jane is even more familiar with Enrique's voice since he's her boss and yells at her every day. Also, a small little detail, at the start of the scene where Peter is actually calling out for Mary Jane when he spots her outside of Moondance Cafe, guess what? She doesn't recognize the voice until she sees his face. Hey! Buzz off! MJ, it's me, Peter. Hi! Something similar happens in Spider-Man 2. Otto Octavius had limited exposure to Peter. When he encounters Spider-Man, he's constantly using his superhero voice. Here's your change! But Otto can tell the voice sounds familiar when Peter uses his actual voice, but even then he can't place the identity of it until Peter unmasks himself. Dr. Octavius. Please tell me how. Peter Parker. Back to Mary Jane Watson. The only instances where she should get a sense of familiarity with Spider-Man's voice is when he says these particular lines. Who are you? You know who I am. I do. Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. I think I have a superhero stalker. I was in the neighborhood. But the film is absolutely aware of this because those lines were deliberately written to vaguely hint at Mary Jane who is behind the mask. But all she gets is a sense of familiarity with the voice and nothing more. Like I said, voice recognition is a much harder memory trigger than facial recognition, and this has been extensively proven in studies, where the individuals being tested would most likely be subjected to the voices of famous celebrities. Voices you've no doubt heard before, but only semi-regularly at best, and this is much the same with Peter and MJ, who know each other, who are friends, but who do not see or associate with one another every day. Finally, and as a matter of fact, I can attest to this firsthand, in addition to all this, there exists this psychological trait that most, if not all, humans possess called non-contextual failure of recognition. Basically, what this means is that if you're given limited exposure to someone and only in a certain context, then when you see them out of their usual surrounding stimuli, as well as if they're dressed differently or change their hair, then it's not uncommon for you to draw a complete blank when you run into, say, your local cashier at the beach or an acquaintance from school or work at the gym. Someone you know but aren't all that close with. And make no mistake, this absolutely applies to facial recognition as well. You'll come face to face with them and you won't have any idea who they are, except for the fact that they are familiar to you. So out of Peter's typical context, what exactly are the odds of Mary Jane Watson recognizing the voice of this costumed, spider-like superhero who's lifting cars and carrying her through the skyscrapers? The answer is... There's no fucking chance in hell that she will recognize it. Like I said, at most, she will feel a sense of familiarity with the voice, but her mind won't be able to connect the dots because there's not enough to connect to. Anyway, moving on. The next scene is awesome. We get to see Spider-Man on just another day on the job, swinging feet first into a burning building while a hysterical mother cries out for her infant trapped in the blaze. Kinda always wondered while watching this what kind of mother would leave their infant child alone to begin with, but oh well. Maybe the baby was asleep, so she stepped out for some groceries or something. We find out later on in the day that it's Thanksgiving, so I suppose it could have been any number of reasons, but let's not get too hung up on that. Another small reason I like this scenario is because this is the first side quest, shall we call it, where we see Spider-Man swing into action to rescue someone from peril, not from being threatened at gunpoint like the muggings we saw earlier, I mean simply just straight up peril, where someone is about to die because something disastrous is happening and only he, the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, can swoop in to save the day. And up till now, with the exception of saving Mary Jane from falling to her death, all we've really seen him do is beat up petty thugs and stop muggings and armed robberies and things like that. Like I said before, one of my favorite things about Spider-Man 1 is how it gives such a well-rounded view of Spider-Man and why he is needed. Which includes the scenarios he finds himself in where he needs to rise up and be the hero. 
Anyway, after about 10 suspenseful seconds, Spider-Man escapes the building with the infant, safe and sound. The mother is beside herself with relief, praising Spider-Man for his heroics. But after this extraordinary save he just pulled off, the police arrive to put him in handcuffs. Since he's implicated in attacking the Daily Bugle and presumably the Unity Day Festival as well. Since aside from the eyewitness accounts, of which there would be a considerable amount, most people likely believe that of the Daily Bugle, which was just given a shit ton of credibility, since Spidey also showed up when Goblin attacked the newspaper outlet after they condemned Goblin and Spider-Man in the paper. And this harkens back to when I said that the city of New York is its own character in the movie, and goes through kind of its own character arc, so to speak. True to the Green Goblin's words, the majority of New York City has begun to hate Spider-Man, although under false allegations. But there's the other side of New York, the ones that Spider-Man actually saves, and those who witness him saving others. He just swung into a burning building to save an infant and return the child safely to his mother. The mother, her neighbours, and the firefighters all saw it happen, and thus Spidey has earned their admiration and respect. The police sergeant, who just arrived on the scene, however, wants to put him in handcuffs because he didn't see a thing. Until someone else can be heard shrieking for help from the blazing inferno. Several stories high where it would be both time-consuming and risky for anyone else to attempt to reach them, except for Spider-Man. Spider-Man tells the police sergeant that he's going to go save them, implying that legally or not, the police have no say in the matter. The police sergeant knows it's against the law, but he also knows it's necessary and the right thing to do, and I just love this little exchange. I'm going. I'll be here when you get back. Not coming back, Chief. Go! Go! You can tell the police sergeant has drastically changed his mind, on his perception of Spidey because now he's urging the web slinger to take action, realizing why he's needed and why would he stop Spider-Man from rescuing an innocent civilian in a burning building. Sure, people read the papers, but anyone who sees Spider-Man in action knows in two seconds that he's not the bad guy. And this is what I meant by New York going through its own character arc because with Spider-Man, not just in this movie, which we'll come back to later, but this is also somewhat paid off in Spider-Man 3, when after years of being Spider-Man, Peter has had enough of an influence on New York that they no longer buy into the media condemning Spider-Man because he has saved enough of them to have countered the narrative and the smear campaign, and that's why New York in Spider-Man 3 loves him. They love me. But back to the scene, Spider-Man once again swings into the burning building, and you can tell... He knows the building isn't going to last much longer when he desperately starts calling out for the civilian who's trapped in there. Where are you? I'm gonna get you out of here. He finds what appears to be an old lady wrapped in a purple cloak, but it ultimately turns out to be the culprit of the blaze himself, the Green Goblin with a very Sam Raimi-esque type jump scare that admittedly freaked the shit out of me when I was a kid. Goblin sends Spidey flying several feet and asks him if he's reconsidered his offer to join in his crusade. Also, sorry to hit the pause button again, but a very select few of you may be wondering why didn't Goblin just use Peter to find Spider-Man, since Peter is now the very public photographer of Spider-Man and may be the best chance of finding him. Well, this line might clue you into that. You're pathetically predictable, like a moth to the flame. Goblin started the fire to get to Spider-Man because A, he's a bloody anarchist, first and foremost. Or we could destroy, cause the deaths of countless innocents in selfish battle again and again and again until we're both dead. <laughs> and B, he knew as the hero, Spider-Man would come scampering right to him. He counted on it. And Goblin's whole goal with Spider-Man is to show him the futility of being a hero. In other words, he did it to prove a point. It was a way of mocking him. Think about it, hero! That anyone can reach out to him and trap him if they use endangering innocence as a lure. Something that also comes full circle later on in the movie's climax. As for the involvement of Peter Parker in helping him to find Spider-Man. Goblin, or at least Norman Osborn for that matter, didn't want to involve Peter in his business as the Goblin. Why would Norman want to involve someone he looks at as a son in something potentially dangerous, especially if he knows how to get to Spider-Man on his own? 
Anyway, Spider-Man refuses Norman and one of the coolest action sequences begins with Spider-Man using his reflexes and acrobatics to dodge Green Goblin's razor bombs in the middle of a blazing inferno. I remember the first time I watched this sequence with my brother, who hyped me up for this moment because he'd already seen the film beforehand, and this sequence left me awestruck, and I still get traces of that feeling whenever I watch this scene 20 years later. Yes, it's a CGI sequence, but who the fuck gives a shit when it looks as awesome as this? This fight, aside from looking gorgeous, also shows us Peter putting all of his enhanced attributes together in order to fight the goblin, using his speed, reflexes, and spidey sense to repeatedly dodge the incoming razor bombs, whilst also using his strength and endurance to withstand goblin's onslaught and fend him off. Spider-Man finally manages to create an opening to escape when he sends Green Goblin flying with an awesome roundhouse kick, and the scene ends with Goblin raging with disappointment that Spider-Man said no. No one says no to me! And then there's this neat little transition to Norman Osborn sporting a concussion inside the elevator as he's getting ready to join his family and friends for Thanksgiving dinner. I know I've outlined many iconic lines throughout this video, but this is definitely one of my favorites and one of the funniest. Oh, Henry. I'm sorry I'm late. Work was murder. I picked up a fruitcake. Yeah, one way you can tell that Norman and Goblin's personalities are overlapping more constantly is the fact that Norman Osborn says this so casually, as if he's being vaguely humorous, but the real joke is that he's actually being literal with this remark. And Norman says this as if it was a line straight from the Goblin. And it's so seamless. I've already mentioned that there are other instances in this sequence where you see subtle expressions of the Green Goblin manifest in Norman's eyes. Like, for example, when he's staring creepily at Mary Jane. But some additional instances of this happening is when he smells Spider-Man in Peter's room. And when he looks at Aunt May like he wants to kill her after she slaps his hand away from the food. Now, I don't have all that much to say about this sequence, since I've covered most of it in other parts of the video already, but one thing I wanted to come back to was Harry's relationship with Norman, and how once again, Mary Jane is just Harry's trophy girlfriend. When Norman is introduced to MJ, it's pretty clear that Harry made her wear the black that he wanted her to wear before at the Unity Day Festival, so it would help impress him. MJ, why didn't you wear the black dress? Just, I wanted to impress my father. He loves black. Well, maybe he'll be impressed no matter what. Now, granted, it's a far more casual occasion, so I don't think it was the exactly the same black garment. But the point stands. And after the dinner is cut short, when Norman has his realization about Peter being Spider-Man, when he saw the cut on Peter's forearm, it's very clear that Goblin does the talking on behalf of Norman Osborn here when he just absolutely destroys Mary Jane with a verbal onslaught, which may or may not have been intended for her to hear. This girl is important to me. Harry, please, look at her. You think a woman like that sniffing around because she likes your personality? Jeez, I know he's acting like a total prick here, but there is one reason why I love this small exchange of dialogue between father and son. Aside from the seamless switch in personalities, it's the bleakness in how Norman Osborn talks about his past marriage. Your mother was beautiful too. They're all beautiful. Until they're snarling after your trust fund like a pack of ravening wolves. Really lets you, the audience, know this dude has been through it all. He has seen more than his fair share and life has chewed him up and spat him right back out. So while this scene is obviously meant for you to hate Norman and to sympathize with Mary Jane, as you should, much like his outburst at the board meeting, you do feel, although in this case a much smaller degree, of pity for Norman. When he's not plagued by his own demons, he really is a nice enough guy, but deep down he's a sad and miserable prick who has a lot of baggage. Anyway, Harry still his father's disappointment, and despite being Mary Jane's sort of boyfriend, barely puts up a fight. You're wrong about her, Dad. A word to the not-so-wise about your little girlfriend. Do what you need to with her, then broom her fast. And Mary Jane is just mortified by this. On the other hand, when Mary Jane stands up for herself, Harry is more than happy to shout her down and defend his father. Thanks for sticking up for me, Harry. You heard? Everyone heard that creep. Creep is my father, all right? If I'm lucky, I'll become half of what he is. So just keep your mouth shut about stuff you don't understand. Harry Osborne. Which is the crux of the issue and what ultimately leads to their relationship falling apart. 
That being that Harry was always more interested in being Norman's son than Mary Jane's boyfriend. And if he stood up to his father like this, the way he probably should have, then their relationship wouldn't have ended this way. Meanwhile, back at Osborne Asylum, Norman wrestles with his alter ego about how to deal with Peter Parker, who he now sees as a traitor, as this has made Spider-Man's refusal to join him that much more personal because before it was just some nobody behind the mask, and now it's someone he holds dear. Worse, actually, it's someone who Norman has helped and guide since the day they met, so Norman is heartbroken and the Goblin is pissed. So the Goblin insists the best way to deal with Peter's betrayal is to make him suffer by watching his loved ones suffer. The cunning warrior attacks neither body nor mind. Tell me how! First, we attack his heart. And this all starts with Aunt May. This innocent old lady still mourning her husband's death is struck in absolute terror when the Green Goblin blasts into her bedroom and just for sheer sadistic amusement wants her to finish praying for him. Finish it! Finish it! <laughs> Peter arrives to the hospital and looks on in horror as his delirious aunt, who's frantically crying out that the goblin was the one who attacked her. And it doesn't take long for Peter to put the pieces together and figure out just what the goblin's game is. He knows who I am. Peter stays with his aunt while she's recuperating in hospital, resting peacefully after the attack, feeling the full weight of the responsibility for what happened to her on his shoulders. All that guilt barrowing down upon him, just as the goblin wants him to feel. But a small measure of comfort arrives when Mary Jane shows up to check up on Aunt May. And this is the first time that Peter has seen her since the Thanksgiving Day disaster. He asks about Harry and if the two of them have made up yet. But Mary Jane tells him that she hasn't called him back, and she's overall, much to Peter's surprise, quite disinterested in discussing Harry because she can't stop thinking about someone else. It doesn't take much for Mary Jane to come out of her shell and tell him the person she can't stop thinking about is Spider-Man. He saved my life twice, and I've never even seen his face. I'm back! I'm back! Wow, him. <laughs> You're laughing! Because he's all she has on her mind. Which you can tell from Peter's smile is like music to his ears. Mary Jane wants to indulge the idea of her and Spider-Man despite it sounding juvenile, but she's a bit hesitant since even she is caught wind of the smear campaign by the media. Peter insists that what she's hearing isn't the truth, and tells her that he's had some hands-on experience with Spider-Man in the past since he's the one who takes the pictures of him for the bugle. Mary Jane eagerly wants to know if she left an impression on Spider-Man, Peter tells her she definitely did, but in a stroke of brilliance, decides to use this opportunity for himself, telling Mary Jane that Spider-Man wanted to know what Peter thinks of her. And she eagerly awaits for him to tell her what he said to him, like she's just woken up for Christmas morning. Peter finally gathers the confidence to tell Mary Jane exactly how he sees her. And this is the moment, this is the moment that makes her fall in love with him. And all of this is brought full circle at Uncle Ben's grave later on. But for now, Peter basically tells MJ that just by being who she is, she can bring out the best in someone, and she can inspire within them the desire to be their best selves. It's one of the most touching moments in the entire movie, and Tobey Maguire and especially Kirsten Dunst sold the absolute living shit out of this scene. And you can tell just by the look in Mary Jane's eyes that these are words that she didn't know she wanted to hear, but upon hearing these words come from Peter, she realized just how much she needed to hear them. That someone truly appreciates her for who she is. And not because she's someone that looks nice in a dress, who can be used as some kind of trophy girlfriend to impress someone's rich and powerful father. And not because she's the popular hot chick in class who everyone fawns over for her looks. And she doesn't have to be any more or less than who she is to truly resonate with another person. And in this moment, the conversation is no longer about Spider-Man. MJ isn't even thinking about Spider-Man anymore. Spider-Man is a distant memory. It's all finally about MJ and Peter. Well, until Harry interrupts at the worst possible times, he turns up at the hospital to check up on Aunt May and, well, is less than impressed to see his sort of girlfriend sharing a very romantically charged moment with his best friend. And then Harry rushes straight home to his father and without knowledge of his father's alter ego, basically tells the Green Goblin 
everything he needs to know for how he can quote attack Peter's heart in the worst possible way. Thanks, Harry. Good call. If there's one person Peter cares about more than Aunt May, it's Mary Jane, according to Harry. And from Norman's perspective, this is the same woman who has just scorned his son. And now Norman sees Peter and MJ, for that matter, as the enemy. Two people who hurt his son. And it's at this point that Norman actually opts to have a very frank conversation with Harry about his lacking for being a competent, loving father to him. Their relationship was difficult and almost estranged, actually, at the beginning of the film due to Norman's workaholic nature. And then because Norman lacked any common ground with his own son, he projected his regret onto Peter by growing closer with him as a fatherly mental figure instead, because both of them were very well versed in science. And I guess in some ways was the son Norman always wanted Harry to be. Not to mention that Peter saw Norman as something of an idol and someone he himself would strive to be. But now that this has happened and Norman sees how much pain Harry's in and the fact that at least in his eyes it was Peter who betrayed him, Norman has a touching moment with Harry with a not so subtle hint of sinister intentions for what's to come and what he's about to do next. I haven't always been there for you, have I? You're busy. You're, you're an important man. I, I understand. That's no excuse. But that aside, Norman finally accepts responsibility for not being there for Harry. And he promises to ensure that that will not be the case going forward. I'm proud of you. And I've lost sight of that somewhere. But I'm going to make it up to you, Harry. I'm going to rectify certain inequities. Influence of the Goblin aside, as well as Norman's intentions, I've always loved this particular line because it shows that even when Norman is trying to be compassionate and a loving father to Harry, this is the kind of language he uses to describe his feelings towards his son's crisis. It goes to show just how ingrained the businessman of Norman Osborn is in his bones. And it's kind of fitting to the scene since the workaholic and the businessman is what hindered the father. And the two share a very heartwarming embrace as father and son. Back at the hospital, however, Peter finally gets the chance to have a one-on-one -on -one heart to heart with his Aunt May. This cheeky old bag admits she listened in on the entirety of the conversation he had with MJ. And so she decides to tell him a story about how he was six years old. And the first time he saw Mary Jane, what his reaction was to seeing her which gives us an even deeper insight into Peter and just how long he's cared for Mary Jane. And we get another look into just how wholesome a character he is. You know, you were about six years old when MJ's family moved in next door. And when she got out of the car and you saw her for the first time, you grabbed me and said, Aunt May? Aunt May? Is that an angel? Gee, did I say that? You sure did. Gee, does that not sound familiar or what? Are you an angel? What? An angel. I heard the deep space pilots talk about that. They're the most beautiful creatures in the universe. Thank you, Mr. Raimi, for putting the dumb shits who perceive this to be an unnatural way for a child to talk right in their fucking place. They live on the moons of Diego, I think. Children tend to say outlandish stuff like that because they perceive the world different to a mature adult and they are far more wholesome with their remarks as well. Peter hasn't even hit puberty yet. And he already saw Mary Jane as this angelic creature. Mary Jane Watson. The woman I've loved since before I even liked girls. You know, you were about six years old when MJ's family moved in next door. And when she got out of the car and you saw her for the first time, you grabbed me and said, Aunt May? Aunt May? Is that an angel? And then we get something so small, but also very cool indeed. She tells him, You do too much. College, a job, all this time with me. You're not Superman, you know. Wow, now that is very rare indeed. And this was largely done because in addition to being a giant Spider-Man fan in his life, Sam Raimi's other favorite superhero was Superman. The fact that Raimi, Stan Lee, and Marvel as a whole were humble enough to reference and pay homage to Superman, their rival companies arguably most popular IP, is something I personally feel needs to be commended, but good luck getting references like that ever again, especially in this day and age where humility is dead and corporatization reigns supreme. In the past 20 years, the only reference to DC Comics in a Marvel movie that I can recall was in Deadpool 2. You're so dark! Do you say you're from the DC Universe? And unless I'm mistaken, there hasn't been one before or since. Wow! What do you know? Anyway, this nice somber moment between Aunt May and Peter is 
Cut short when Aunt May brings to his attention that Mary Jane could very well be in danger. If Goblin knows who he is, and he's come after Aunt May, Mary Jane was just at the hospital after all, and if Goblin was watching, she could very well be next. He calls Mary Jane only to find Willem Dafoe's patented Green Goblin laughter. <laughs> Can Spider-Man come out to play? Where is she? And goddamn, Defoe nailed this role. I can't speak enough praise about the guy. And so the stage has been set for the final showdown. Now the final confrontation on the bridge between Spider-Man and the Green Goblin is another instance where Raimi took inspiration from the comics, though it appears he preferred the adaptation in the animated series. Spider-Man and Green Goblin fight over Mary Jane, and yes, it's on a very similar looking bridge, but in the comics, these events actually transpire around the character of Gwen Stacy, but she hasn't been introduced into this story as of yet. So it's no wonder why this sequence seems more inspired from the cartoon adaptation where Mary Jane was the focus. But unlike the balls out wackiness of the animated series, there's no device that opens up portals to other dimensions because given the mostly realistic world Sam Raimi had crafted for this comic book movie, well a device that opens portals to other dimensions would have just been batshit insane. So anyway, Spider-Man goes to confront Green Goblin on the bridge and the type of villain the Green Goblin has been is the Anarchist. A power hungry, insane, chaos inciting villain who in this case respects the hero but ultimately wants to beat him in a manner that's most cruel by taking the hero out of him. The scenario that Goblin has placed Spider-Man in, no matter the choice, he will still at least from Spider-Man's point of view have blood on his hands for failing to save Mary Jane, the woman he loves, or dozens of innocent children. And not to mention New York, or at least those who aren't eyewitnesses, will undoubtedly hate him just like I hated him for the attack on the Daily Bugle that he was supposedly complicit in. But what's the other choice? Well, if Spider-Man decides to be a true hero and not compromise with Goblin, attempting to save everyone, well, he'll be left completely helpless or at least vulnerable enough for Goblin to kill him. No matter what choice Peter makes, Goblin ultimately wins one way or another. This is why only fools are heroes. Because you never know when some lunatic will come along with a sadistic choice. Make your choice, Spider-Man, and see how a hero is rewarded. It's the perfect plan that's trapped Spider-Man, putting him in a predicament where, no matter the outcome, Goblin will always win. It makes sense that Goblin would come up with something so devious and foolproof, considering he is Norman Osborn after all, and it really is the perfect plan, save for one small oversight, but we'll talk about that in a second. We are who we choose to be! Now choose! No! But nonetheless, Spider-Man makes the only choice a hero would make, which is not choosing, not compromising, and not letting the villain get his way. Using some pretty slick Spider-Man maneuvers, he manages to save both Mary Jane and the children from the fall. But unfortunately now, Spider-Man is completely helpless and is an open target for Green Goblin. A barge is on its way to allow Spidey to drop the children and Mary Jane safely without the danger of them drowning. Meanwhile, Goblin is taking his time, lining up some brutal power punches on Spidey, each of them landing with sickening precision, until he finally says, It's time to die! People are probably wondering why he doesn't just use the blades to begin with, but that kind of goes against what Goblin was doing. Yes, he could have ended Spidey with the glider in the first place, but the whole point was he was trying to test Spidey to see if he would break. And in a sense, Goblin was torturing his spirit inflicting pain on Spider-Man right up until the last second, which upon then he would use the blades and impale him. Because if Spidey won't break, well, Goblin can't just let him win, can he? Which, like I said, that's what makes Goblin's plan so brilliant. If Spidey chooses, then he gets blood on his hands. If he doesn't choose, and if he doesn't break, then he pays the price for being a hero, which is death. And as I said, it's the perfect plan. That is until... Aside from that ridiculous life-saving throw, I love the way the people of New York are portrayed in this particular instance, being a character all their own. They, as a character, look past all the bullshit, the smoke screens of the media and the police, and come to Spidey's aid. Further goes to show what I've been saying, like, out of sight, out of mind, sure, New York hated Spidey when they bought into the bullshit. 
So at first, once the media started misrepresenting Spider-Man, New York really started to hate him. Matter of fact, this actually gets really bad in Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man won't let me take any more pictures. You've turned the whole city against him. A fact I'm very proud of. Now. But the reason Spider-Man still had avid support throughout New York is because eventually Spidey saved enough people with enough witnesses that brought out the truth. Which is why in Spider-Man 3, Peter has essentially weathered the storm and now New York had finally become very pro-Spider-Man. Which is why they eventually gave him the key to the city after he saves Gwen Stacy from the fall. But Spider-Man 3 is for another time. What I'm getting at is we've seen glimpses of New York seeing Spidey's true colors when he saved the baby from the burning building and when we saw that montage at the beginning where Spider-Man first began fighting crime. But this time is the first time we've seen New York as a collective come together for Spider-Man. It's a very heartwarming payoff that the film definitely earned. And it basically goes to show all of Spidey's good deeds didn't fall on blind eyes and deaf ears. And ultimately was good karma because it ended up saving his life. Not to mention, I just fucking love this bit. Oh yeah, I got something for your ass! You mess with Spidey, you mess with New York! You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us! So Spidey saves the day, but Goblin is furious and so latches on a harpoon and tow cable around Spidey and drags him to an abandoned building where he proceeds to make Spider-Man pay. And as we all know, this is one of the most brutal fight scenes in any Spider-Man movie, if not the most brutal. <laughs> one of the most brutal fights in any superhero movie for that matter. Goblin just goes to town on Spider-Man. First he damn near blows Spider-Man's face off with the pumpkin bomb, and then Spider-Man proceeds to get the absolute shit beaten out of him. One thing I'd like to make crystal clear about Sam Raimi, if I haven't already, is that the dude makes sure the violence felt real. I can't stress that enough. Not without its movie cliches, don't get me wrong, and I'll get to one in just a second, but everything from how the scenes were shot, acted, and even the sound design lent to making this feel like a hardcore bare knuckle brawl. And as a matter of fact, see, Sam Raimi coming from his R-rated horror background isn't exactly against graphical violence in his movies, or television productions for that matter. Need any more proof, just go watch Ash vs. Evil Dead. But anyway, point is, as violent and hard-hitting as this scene is, it's just a wonder why it wasn't even more violent given that it was Raimi directing it. And as a matter of fact, I believe Sony actually told Raimi to tone down the blood in this scene, which is why Toby gets the saliva knocked out of him instead. Anyway, after Spider-Man endures a massive beating, Goblin decides he's going to finish it, but not before taking the time to torment Peter one last time in the most callous way possible. I'm going to finish her nice and slow. That does it. It's time to stop holding back, and Peter brings out that unhinged side of him we saw back in the alleyway. Something this movie makes damn clear is threaten Mary Jane in front of Spidey, prepare to get fucked up. And thus we have Spidey's breaking point moment. One small gripe I have is, all of a sudden, Green Goblin has this electric trident thingy that he seemingly pulled out of the fucking ether. Yet another small movie cliche. See, Sam Raimi has this really bad habit of giving his villains deadly weapons out of nowhere in order to try and heighten the tension. And this won't be the last time. But let's just be crystal clear. These cliches stem far beyond just the Raimi Spider-Man movies. They have been done in other comic book movies, other Spider-Man movies, and been done worse. You're worse. <laughs> much, much worse. So be sure to keep that in mind before getting too hung up on things. Anyway, if I had to tweak one thing about this scene, I wish Goblin had used a part of his surroundings as a weapon instead. But regardless, Peter's back is literally against the wall here, and he's about to be impaled. After a tense struggle, he uses every ounce of his strength to repel Goblin, and then Spider-Man proceeds to bring his wrath and the entire building itself down upon him. Get him, Spidey. Your will is stronger than his. Kick his buttocks. This is one of the most satisfying scenes, seeing Spidey get destroyed, brought to his lowest point, only for him to gut it out and come back with a vengeance. The monster awakens. Until finally, Goblin can no longer take the onslaught, and Norman Osborn reveals the truth to Peter. 
who's absolutely beside himself. Norman talks about how his actions were never his own, and he speaks of the goblin like it's something of a possession, an entity of some kind, that takes him over, insisting to Peter that he's innocent, while simultaneously plotting his demise, solidifying to us, the audience, that he's deceiving Peter because the goblin and Norman are indeed one and the same. If they weren't before, they certainly are now. We've reached the point of no return. As Norman slowly moves his glider into position to impale Spider-Man, he extends his arm to Peter, asking him to have faith in him, to trust in the father figure he has been to him in the past. But Peter remains skeptical, not so quick to forgive. And while Norman and him did form a bond, Peter remembers the one man who truly raised him. The one who taught him of the importance of responsibility. Stop lecturing me, please. I don't mean to lecture and I don't mean to preach. And I know I'm not your father. Then stop pretending to be. I have a father. His name was Ben Parker. Green Goblin, realizing that the jig is up, offers Peter some parting words before attempting the killing blow. Unaware of Peter's spider sense that at the last moment saves his life, seals Norman's demise. Peter watches in horror as another man he cares for dies right before his eyes. But just before he takes his final breath, we see one last glimmer of Norman Osborn emerge to give Peter his dying wish. To protect his son from the truth. Peter, don't tell Harry. <laughs> And I think personally, when Norman first unmasked himself in front of Peter, Peter was angry at the revelation, like he didn't understand the nature of Norman's madness. But seeing him transform back and forth right before his eyes, as he was dying, he at the very least understood Norman wasn't an evil man, but he was actually just very sick and needed help. And he was a father who deep down truly loved his son, Peter's best friend, after all. And so his anger turned to sorrow. Peter fulfills Norman's last wish and returns his body back to the Osborne penthouse having wrapped the body in cloth and presumably disposed of any evidence that would tie his identity to that of the Green Goblin. Unfortunately, while performing this final act of kindness, he's stumbled upon by the very person he was trying to protect. Harry Osborne catches Spider-Man with his father's lifeless body, the body of the one he loved more than anyone in the world. The father he had only just finally reconciled with. And now that chance to have the meaningful relationship with him that he's always wanted is gone forever. And Harry, in his blind rage, assumes the worst possible scenario has occurred. Now, just really quickly, I wanted to address something. I've heard more really moronic arguments about why didn't anyone figure out Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin? Well, a number of reasons, actually. Firstly, as previously mentioned, only Norman Osborn and Dr. Strom knew about the illegal experimentation with the performance enhancers. And if not being discovered was the goal in the first place, I'm pretty sure the chief scientist and owner of the company would know how to abscond with the glider and the flight suit and the Green Goblin weaponry whilst remaining undiscovered. Secondly... Why would Norman Osborn steal from his own company and kill his chief scientist? The primary suspect, I would imagine, would be Quest Aerospace, Oscorp's rival company. Which, by the way, it's never made clear whether or not the authorities figured out who attacked Quest Aerospace. It just referenced that there was a bombing of some kind, but they never found the culprit. What? Yes, Quest Aerospace is recapitalizing in the wake of the bombing. Expanding. They made a tender offer we can't ignore. But that aside, let's move on to the Unity Day Festival, which is my third point. Why would Norman Osborn bomb Quest Aerospace and his own company's board of directors with a glider that was stolen? People are probably going to say, well, there's a motive. Norman was getting ousted by the board of directors and he wanted to maintain his position. So it benefits him if they all perish. Let's assume, let's just for a second assume that the authorities actually make it that far. Because this is the final nail in the coffin. Why would Norman Osborn, head of Oscorp Industries, with his frickin' name on the side of the building with a glider that was stolen from his own company, try to kill his own son? Jordan fades back! Swoosh! And that's the game! And before the bottom of the barrel out there come at me with Green Goblin and Norman Osborn died on the same day argument. Firstly, I'm sure there are dozens, if not hundreds, of people in New York that died that very same day, genius. Secondly, as far as New York is concerned, Green Goblin disappeared after the fight on the bridge, 
and Norman Osborne turned up dead at his house later that evening with stab wounds that he could have obtained in any number of ways. And thirdly, there was absolutely nothing to tie Norman Osborne to the Green Goblin in the first place. Peter made damn sure of that in accordance with Norman Osborne's last wish. The only thing to tie Norman Osborne to the Green Goblin is the fact that Harry witnessed Spider-Man bring Norman's dead body home after Spider-Man was last seen fighting the Green Goblin. Now Norman's death could have happened later that very night on an unrelated matter. But that aside, let's indulge this for a second. Even if they somehow managed to know that the stab wounds came from the Green Goblin's glider, for the reasons I just outlined, I think it makes much more sense to assume Norman was killed by the Green Goblin, and no one would assume Norman took his own life. Yes, Spider-Man 3's plot is very stupid, so don't even at me. What are you trying to tell me? The blade that pierced his body came from his glider. That's great! Why didn't you say so? And of course, you have proof of that! But that aside, everybody, especially after the Unity Day Festival, would very likely assume Green Goblin targeted Norman Osborn since he was the last member of the Oscorp board of directors left alive. Once again, the people providing the criticism that Norman Osborn should have been outed as the Green Goblin are speaking from the perspective of the audience and not the perspective of the characters, which in this case would be the city of New York. Anyway, moving on. And now this finally brings us to the final scenes of the cemetery. Peter pays his respects to Harry at Norman's funeral, extending a hand of compassion and ensuring him he knows what he's going through, having lost a father himself in Uncle Ben. Harry, on the other hand, in the wake of Norman's death, isn't interested in Peter's kind words. He isn't interested in mourning his loss, because in Harry's eyes, his father didn't die. He didn't lose him. He was taken from him by Spider-Man. I don't know what it's like to lose a father. I didn't lose him. He was stolen from me. One day, Spider-Man will pay. I swear on my father's grave, Spider-Man will pay. Now, as I said previously, the true tragedy of Harry Osborn and Norman Osborn is that Norman passed away just after the two had finally reconciled with one another. But now Norman is gone, and Harry didn't get to have the relationship with his father that he always wanted. Of course, he's jumping to conclusions, but Harry, in his grief, looks for someone to blame for his pain. And in a tragic irony, in the same speech, he swears vengeance on Spider-Man while simultaneously embracing Peter as a brother, leaving us, the audience, to wonder just what will happen, not if, but when, Harry inevitably finds out the terrible truth. What's also tragic about Harry's character is, at the start of the movie, he resented his father's company and his wealth, but now that he's lost him, he's become cold and full of hatred and regret. Because now all he longs for is revenge on Spider-Man and to live up to his father's name. I swear on my father's grave, Spider-Man will pay. I really like um, James Franco's performance in this scene. I really feel he's becoming his father. Finally walking to that car that he was so embarrassed of. Yeah. In the first scene. Charles, can we drive around the corner, please? Why? The entrance is right there. Don't ever be ashamed of who you are. I'm not ashamed of who I am. Just... Just what I am. Forget it. That's a great shot. He's almost walking to his destiny. He's very understated. I think he's uh, just brilliant in this last part. You can feel the evil brewing uh, inside him and the hatred. James Franco had actually come in for Spider-Man and we'd just been so taken with him, thought he was remarkable. And there's a real, you'll see in the movie, you re this real kind of, um, you really believe he and Willem are father and son. It's quite a complex relationship, done very subtly and, and I think really well. As Peter watches Harry leave the cemetery, he utters one of his most iconic lines and heavily foreshadows the theme for the next movie. No matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, the ones I love will always be the ones who pay. See, the theme of this movie, obviously, is responsibility, but... What Spider-Man 1 doesn't show us until the very end is the cost of that responsibility. And it's for this reason I've always seen Spider-Man 1 as kind of like the honeymoon phase with Peter and his new powers. Uncle Ben's death showed him why he can't ignore his responsibility. But what it didn't prepare him for was the lifelong burden he would carry with him. Peter actually doesn't feel the true weight of those responsibilities until right this moment in the cemetery. And this perfectly carries into the second film, which is all about the cost of responsibility and the sacrifice of self-happiness in order to make the right choice in choosing oneself. 
that being Spider-Man is not just a gift, but it's also a curse. And this realization Peter has comes in the most tragic of ways. Seeing Spider-Man make an arch enemy, someone who will look to hurt him and the ones he loves. He witnesses this firsthand, and it comes from his best friend of all people. Harry's threats are what give Peter his newfound perspective, and I love how he turns to both Mary Jane and Aunt May, knowing that they'll always be in danger for as long as he's Spider-Man. Peter, perhaps looking for guidance, returns to Uncle Ben's grave, where Mary Jane goes to comfort him, but she also has something very important to say, because she herself has come to a realization. There's something I've been wanting to tell you. And in probably the most cathartic scene for the audience, we finally get to see Mary Jane Watson pour her heart out to Peter. She tells him, when it came to life and death, the last person she wanted to see, because he's the only one who actually sees her for who she is, who supports her in everything, and who makes her feel like she can be herself, something I made sure to cover extensively in this video, that person was Peter. I kept thinking, I hope I make it through this. So I could see Peter Parker's face one more time. Living in New York, I think she grows up and, and she realizes who she really cares about in her life. And the one man who ever loved her for who she is, and it didn't matter, you know. He really liked her for the Mary Jane inside of her. There's only one man who's always been there for me. Who makes me feel like I'm more than I ever thought I could be. That I'm just me. What we were really looking for was someone who had a chemistry with Tobey Maguire. We wanted the audience to recognize that these two people had a connection, and we wanted the audience to need them to be together. I love you. Oh, I love you so much, Peter. That'll do it. And so Mary Jane and Peter share a very passionate kiss and all of a sudden, the circumstances are reversed. Peter spent most of his life longing for MJ, and at the beginning of the movie, we see him trying to work up the courage to even talk to her, even reciting what he thinks he might say to her so he doesn't freeze in the moment. He was the one chasing her, but now she is the one who's chasing him, longing for him, plagued by feelings and thoughts she wants to share with him. Peter has got the girl. They even shared this great kiss with each other. All he has to do is just say the words, and he'll have what he's always wanted. It's the storybook fairy tale ending of the hero getting the girl and riding off into the sunset, except no. Peter now having realized the cost of responsibility, actually in what is probably the hardest thing he's ever had to do up to this point, actually rejects the girl of his dreams. This is the first time I remember as a kid having my expectations subverted. I actually remember being a little disappointed by this at the time. I didn't quite understand why Peter did this, and, and this is one of the biggest reasons, in addition to everything else I've discussed, why as an adult I hold Spider-Man 1 in such high regard. Because in retrospect, this is the best example of expectation subversion I think I've ever seen. Because all the audience wants for Peter is to be happy. And he deserves that happiness, without a doubt, with MJ. But Peter, of his own volition, makes the hardest choice of his life and turns her down. And we get this bittersweet, this beautiful, yet heart-wrenching exchange between these excellent characters and their unbelievably gifted actors. I want you to know that I will always be there for you. I will always be there to take care of you. I promise you that. I will always be your friend. Only your friend? Peter Parker? That's all I have to give. Perfect. Absolutely fucking flawless ending. Made only better by MJ's realization. Obviously she can't prove it, and she can't know for sure, but the passion that she felt during that kiss was very familiar. And now she has a strong feeling for who her mystery man is behind the mask. And as Peter walks away onward towards his destiny, not only does this complete at least his first character arc, but it brings the entire movie full circle because we started this with a monologue and now we're finishing with one. And we see just how much Peter's grown from the pathetic, dorky, loser teenager who just wanted to get the girl to this empowered, heroic, moral man who now has this extraordinary purpose, these extraordinary gifts, and whose perspective has completely changed as he walks away from the woman he loves. He knows who he is. We know who he is. I'm Spider-Man. And then we get this awesome final swinging sequence where Spider-Man's full abilities and grace are on display. 
Peter has fully embraced and fallen into his alter ego. The transformation is complete. He is now Spider-Man and thus that brings us to the end of this movie. No, not just a movie, a masterpiece. Ha! Gay! And fun fact, this final swinging sequence was the last thing they completed for this movie. It took 18 months to make, which shows you just how far Sam Raimi and his incredible team planned ahead for how they knew they wanted this movie to end. And I can't in good conscience end this video without talking about its production and the team who made this incredible film. But before I close out this video, I want to do something I normally save for the end, which is to dish out some thank yous, as well as bringing your attention to some other parts of my channel that may be of interest to you. Reason I'm doing this now is because I'd like to end the video on a high, so if you'll be kind enough to indulge me, this will only take a few moments. Firstly, thank you all for checking out this video, and I really hope you've enjoyed it, and be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Secondly, you can feel free to check out my Discord server if you want to chat to my community about Marvel, Spider-Man, video games, comic book movies, or whatever. I've left a link in the description. Check it out at your leisure, and who knows, maybe you'll make some friends along the way. A special thank you to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members for supporting my videos and my channel. I've left a link to Patreon below if you're interested in becoming one. Or you could just hit the join button to become a YouTube member. Once again, a special thank you to a British Potato and Coolman229 for helping me out with the audio editing for this video. I've left a link to their channels below. Check them out, they make great content. I also want to give a big shout out and thank you to AngelRin89 for her excellent feedback and helping to make this video as good as it possibly could be. So thank you as well. And that just about does it for everything I wanted to say regarding my channel and the thank yous. So... Without further ado, let's get back to the movie. Spider-Man 1 is an incredibly special film, not just because of the story it tells and how the film goes about telling it, not just because it helped launch the popularity of comic book movies into the stratosphere, and not just because of its year of release, but its production team and hell, even its studio backing was simply superb, and everyone had their heart and their mind in the right place. The studio took a chance on hiring a passionate, but relatively small-time director, who was a massive Spider-Man fan and who wanted to do both the character and their movie justice. The studio was also humble enough to listen to the director who hired a relatively unknown actor at the time for the lead role of Peter Parker with Tobey Maguire and the studio agreed. I read the script and I liked the script and I met with Sam Raimi and talked to him about his vision for the film and then I was totally sold and then me and Sam had to go sell the studio on me. Sam Raimi wanted to hire Willem Dafoe for the role of Green Goblin and Willem got the part largely due to a simple phone conversation he had with Raimi, where the two just talked for hours on end about how much they loved the Spider-Man franchise. If you've done any level of research on this movie the way I have, you'd know that astoundingly little of it was shot on location in New York. Yet this movie manages to give you one of the most romanticized experiences of New York City, and that was largely due to the location scouts and the outstanding set designers. <laughs> The sets were really fun to work on and really fun to see them build and exciting to see them go up. Each set is such a character in this film and New York is an important part of this movie. It'll have like a romantic feel to it, I think. There are parts of New York that are magical. So what we decided to do was just to create a whole city of those realistic, magical parts of New York. Neil Spizak uh, truly loves New York, understands New York, and was able to bring his passion of New York to the film. One of the design elements that I tried to incorporate into the film as a whole is a slightly overscaled and somewhat classical architecture, building tops and places that you normally aren't on buildings, closer to the upper architecture of the buildings in New York. In addition to all of the praise I've levied towards this movie, and I previously spoke on this earlier, but this film's impact on pop culture, and not to mention the film industry as a whole since it released, is pretty evident by how highly regarded it is amongst both moviegoers, comic book fans, and Spider-Man fans in general, it certainly laid the blueprint for many comic book films and live-action comic book origin stories for many movies and television series that have been released since, with only a few executing to equal or greater effect. But speaking of the fan base, it's worth noting just how interactive this film's fans continue to be to this day. 
despite the fact that Spider-Man 1 released over 20 years ago. Spider-Man 1 also released one of the first comic book movie video game adaptations, which even starred the movie's original cast members, to voice the characters. Who are you? No, wait. Let me guess. The Emerald Elf? <laughs> me? I'm just a concerned citizen helping to clean up our fair city. Now, while the game itself had some clunky mechanics, admittedly, it did set yet another trend which would lead to many other games trying to replicate, again, to equal or greater effect. Granted, many games would try this and fail, but two notable exceptions was Ang Lee's Hulk video game adaptation. Trust me when I tell you that game was an absolute blast to play. And of course, Spider-Man 2's video game adaptation, which was highly regarded as the best Spider-Man video game ever made until Insomniac came out with their love letter to the character and the franchise back in 2018. To this day, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man fanbase is coming out with incredible memes, still poking fun and paying homage to the Raimi trilogy, and many fans, myself included, are still demanding, to this day, just one more Spider-Man film from Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire. Speaking of which, current year Sony, would you mind getting your shit together and greenlitting Spider-Man 4? The real Spider-Man 4. Make it happen already. But now, screeching things to a bit of a dour note here, while we're discussing the city of New York, one elephant in the room needs to be addressed. And that, regrettably, is 9-11. One of America's greatest tragedies, and none felt it harder than the city of New York. Hell, I'm Australian, and I was like five years old when I saw the breaking news that stopped the world, and I'll never forget it. That being said, this tragedy happened in the middle of Spider-Man's production. And given that this tragedy happened to New York City, and New York City takes center stage in the movie... It certainly caused some complications, since the wounds were about as fresh as they possibly could have been, which is why one of the goals of this movie was to raise the spirit of New York City, while they were still reeling from this tragic event that forever changed the face of their city. That's partially why there's so many instances throughout the movie where it focuses on the perspective of the average New Yorker, and giving the audience a sense of unity when they see New York coming together for Spider-Man. That's also why Spider-Man is constantly swinging past and latching on to flagpoles. However, a decision had to be made to either include the Twin Towers as part of New York's skyline, or to erase them from the film. Personally, I think they made the right decision to exclude them from the movie, which has allowed Spider-Man to age a bit more gracefully over time, as opposed to, say, Die Hard with a Vengeance, which has several shots centered on the Twin Towers, as well as Home Alone 2. Now, these are just two examples of, I'm sure, countless other films. Of course, these movies came out before the tragedy happened, and while they are nice showcases of those legendary skyscrapers, it does act as a double-edged sword because it's also a constant reminder of the tragedy. And needless to say, this wasn't going to fly for Spider-Man back in 2002. And so the World Trade Centers are almost nowhere to be found in this movie. Although, likely most of you know about the band teaser trailer, that featured the Twin Towers, but one of those trailer shots actually made it into the final cut of the movie, and you can still see the Twin Towers reflected in Spider-Man's mask. Now, whether that was a mistake, or was intentionally left in the film, I think it was a great decision to keep it in the movie this way, turning the Twin Towers into more of an Easter egg, displayed subtly for the attentive audience member, is a small way to pay homage to their memory, without putting it front and center to bluntly remind the audience of New York's darkest day. Now, all that being said, there's a couple of special mentions I'd like to make about key members of the production crew. The first being Laura Ziskin, one of the head producers of this movie, and the rest of the Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, in fact, as well as The Amazing Spider-Man in 2012. From what I can tell, she basically acted as Sam Raimi's Rick McCallum to his George Lucas. She really lent to putting this production together. Unfortunately, she passed away back in 2011, but special thanks to her for everything she did in helping make this movie happen. Another key production individual is Mr. John Deekstra, who was essentially the visual effects maestro who was key in delivering us all those excellent CG Spider-Man sequences involving his action and swinging montages throughout the movie. Much of what he did, Sam Raimi, the director, wasn't even sure was possible, but he ended up being astounded at what Deekstra was able to deliver. was so important to me that it looked real. If it looked bogus, it wasn't going to work. Our optical effects supervisor, John Dykstra, convinced me that it would be possible. 
the important part of this movie was to make sure that the character's humanity showed through even when he became a superhero. And although we'd like to think that our stunt people and our actors can do all of these terrific fly-through-the-city scenes, the truth of the matter is that it's either too dangerous or, or physically impractical for them to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to fill in between the lines. I think that we are very fortunate to have John Darkstra on this movie. John has an amazing legacy in the effect business. You don't invent technology and then figure out what to do with it. You come up with an artistic problem, and then you have to invent the technology in order to accomplish it. So it's the opposite of what most people think it is, and any artist will tell you that. Also, I know I mentioned him previously, but this guy honestly can't get enough praise. Thank you, Stan Lee, you absolute legend. Avia Rod, you're an absolute mad lad. The cast are all legends in their own right and did an outright flawless job. So thank each and every single one of them for everything they did. And last and most importantly, thank you, Sam Raimi, for being the right man in the right place at the right time and giving us this timeless masterpiece. This is Sam Raimi on behalf of the cast and crew and everybody who worked on Spider-Man. Thank you for watching the movie with us.